Next, the House campaign fundraising investigation hearings. Today, the Government Reform and Oversight Committee focused on an Interior Department decision that rejected a gambling casino proposed by the Chippewa Indian Tribe. Among the witnesses, members heard from three chairmen from the tribe. Indiana Congressman Dan Burton chairs the hearing. It's seven hours and 15 minutes. The committee will come to order. Uh, good morning. Before I uh, make any comments, I would like to ask my colleague, Mr. Waxman, if he's going into the wallpapering business. <laughs> That's the biggest display I've seen. Uh, Perhaps in the future we could make them a little smaller, but we won't take too much issue with that. It's very colorful. Mr. Chairman, perhaps in the course of a hearing, we can allow the people who have brought that uh, exhibit to, to be able to present their side of the issue to us. I think it's appropriate, and I'm going to make a point of that in my opening statement. Uh -huh. We're hearing only one side of the story, and I think we ought to be able to hear all sides of the story since there's more than one involved. At the proper time, we'll entertain uh, uh, your comments and statements regarding that. Good morning, a quorum being present. The Committee on Government Reform and Oversight will come to order. Before Mr. Waxman and I deliver our opening statements, we will dispose of some procedural issues first. I ask unanimous consent that all members and witnesses' statements be included in the record, without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that all exhibits, articles, and extraneous or tabular material referring to, referred to during this hearing be included in the record, and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that the following depositions be included in the record. Michael Anderson, Loretta Avent, Michael Chapman, Tom Cochran, Corcoran, Ada Deer, Franklin Duchenay, Ducheneau, Tom Hartman, Robin Jager, Hilda Manuel, Kevin Manuel, Kevin Meisner, Patrick O'Donnell, Mike Schmidt, Tom Schneider, Heather Sibison, George Scabine, and Jennifer O'Connor. Without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that Leon Panetta's responses to interrogatories be included in the record, and without objection, so ordered. I ask unanimous consent that questioning in the matter under consideration proceed under Clause 2J2 of House Rule 11 and Committee Rule 14, in which the Chairman and Ranking Minority Member allocate time to Committee Council as they deem appropriate for extended questioning not to exceed 60 minutes equally divided between the majority and minority. Without objection, so ordered. Hold that for me. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, our first hearings on campaign fundraising abuses of the new year. And I'd like to wish all of my colleagues who are here today a happy new year since we weren't here earlier in the year. And I hope everyone had a good break. Today, we will begin two weeks of hearings into alleged political interference in a decision by the Interior Department to deny a permit for an Indian gambling facility in Wisconsin. Specifically, did the prospect of DNC contributions, Democrat National Committee contributions, sway the outcome of this application? Up until this point, our hearings have focused primarily on illegal foreign money. At the conclusion of this set of hearings, I expect to return our focus to that subject. However, I raised importance that I believe it's essential that we review them. While we have begun a new year, I expect that this investigation will continue to face many of the same old obstacles. Twenty-four witnesses have either fled the country or refused to return for questioning. Forty-six witnesses have taken the Fifth Amendment. This is a total of 70 people, some of them very close friends and appointees of the president, who have refused to cooperate with this investigation. And I think that fact is just astonishing. At the same time, the White House and the Democratic National Committee will continue, continue to drag their feet on producing documents. We requested all of the rele relevant documents from the White House over a year ago. They were subpoenaed last March, yet important White House documents continue to dribble in some just arrived last weekend. DNC Chairman Roy Romer recently told the press that he would no longer comply with congressional subpoenas. And that's a fine example for a prominent figure, public figure to set. The president recently complained about all of the investigations pending against his administration. 
He said it was all partisan politics. But let's examine the record. President Clinton vowed in 1992 to have, quote, the most ethical administration, end quote, in history. But look at the facts. Six current or former cabinet secretaries have had their conduct examined under the independent counsel statute. Four independent counsels have been appointed to investigate the Clinton administration, including the Whitewater Independent Counsel, which is investigating business partners of the president and the first lady. Two former Clinton cabinet secretaries have been indicted by, by independent counsels. Independent counsel Ken Starr has secured 14 convictions, including those of Associate Attorney General Webster Hubble and then sitting Governor, uh, Governor of Arkansas Jim Guy Tucker. Independent counsel Schmaltz, who testified before our committee a few weeks ago, has obtained 20 convictions relating to events during Secretary Espy's tenure at the Agricultural Department and has recently indicted former Secretary Espy himself. Independent counsel Barrett has secured an indictment against former Housing and Urban Development Secretary Henry Cisneros. Others connected with the investigation have pled guilty. The President and Vice President underwent a preliminary investigation under the Independent Counsel Act, and the task force investigation continues to include an examination of actions by senior White House and administration officials. This is not a ringing endorsement of what President Clinton said would be the most ethical administration in U.S. history. We recently learned in the realm of foreign money that New York District Attorney Robert Morgenthau forwarded information to the Justice Department about a large series of foreign contributions to the DNC in the 1992 campaign from Venezuelan sources. Again, the Justice Department took a pass. However, Mr. Morgenthau has worked with us to unseal evidence of this foreign money being funneled into the DNC coffers in 1992, and we intend to further review this matter. We have seen an amazing pattern of foreign money flowing into the Democratic coffers, campaign coffers from many sources. South America, Hong Kong, Thailand, Macau, Indonesia, and the Middle East. If these were a few isolated instances, one could believe that they happened without the knowledge of the Clinton administration or DNC campaign officials. But the accumulated weight of the circumstantial evidence is overwhelming. It is hard to believe that so much money could have come into the DNC from so many countries without someone being aware of it. Now let me turn my attention to the topic of today's hearings. I am not going to recite the entire history of events that, we are now, now, that are now the subject of a preliminary inquiry by the Justice Department. I think the basic facts are well known. The Department of Interior rejected an application for a casino submitted by three very poor Indian tribes in Wisconsin after a fierce lobbying campaign waged by several very wealthy tribes from Minnesota. The wealthy tribes later turned around and contributed over $350,000 to the Democrat National Committee. Two of Secretary Babbitt's senior staff, his chief of staff, and counsel left the Interior Department and gained lucrative jobs representing the Shakopees, the wealthiest opponent of the application. Under the Ethics and Government Act, this would normally be illegal. However, there is an exception in the law that allows federal employees to leave their government jobs and immediately represent Native American tribes before their former agencies. Secretary Babbitt's former Chief of Staff, Mr. Collier, who was involved in the decision-making process and left the department shortly thereafter, personally delivered either a $50,000 or $100,000 check to the DNC from his, from his clients, the Shakopees who benefited from the decision according to previous testimony. One thing I would like to do today is respond to a few of the statements Secretary Babbitt has been making over the last couple of weeks. He has been on a media offensive. He has made a number of statements that don't hold water and I want to respond to a few of them. He even has a website now to put his own personal spin on this issue. Secretary Babbitt has alleged that all of the investigations, including the investigation into his activities and the Interior Department, are only partisan. This has become a familiar line for the Clinton administration officials under investigation. But let me say this. I didn't make these allegations against Secretary Babbitt. This committee did not make these allegations. Senator Thompson didn't make these allegations against the secretary. These allegations were made by his own lifelong friend, his law partner, his former campaign manager, Mr. Paul Eckstein. 
Mr. Eckstein testified that Secretary Babbitt told him that he had been instructed by Harold Ickes to make the decision on the casino that day. Mr. Eckstein said Secretary Babbitt also asked him if he knew how much money these people had raised. Secretary Babbitt initially reacted by denying that he ever had said any of these things to Mr. Eckstein. A year later, he changed his story. He said he did make the comments about Ickes, but that he was lying to his old friend to get him out of the office. Which of these stories is true and which is false? When did he tell the truth and when did he lie? After hearing Secretary Babbitt change his story so dramatically, it is even conceivable that Congress would not, is it conceivable that Congress would not launch a thorough investigation into this entire matter? Would we be responsible if we did not call Secretary Babbitt to testify? I want to respond to another statement that Secretary Babbitt made. He told the Star Tribune and a few other newspapers that we want the facts out. The more the facts out are out, the better. The faster, the better. That has not been our experience with the Interior Department. It has taken months and months to extract the relevant documents from them. I first requested all of the documents about this casino application from the Interior Department in August of last year. We did not receive the first documents until October, two months later. We did not receive the bulk of the documents, six boxes, until January, after we had begun taking depositions. This is not cooperation. This is inexcusable. We are still receiving documents bit by bit. We have received two more files of documents over the weekend, this past weekend, five months after we, re we requested them. These are not the actions of a group of people who want to get the facts out. If Secretary Babbitt is going to tell the press that he wants to get all the facts out as fast as possible, he should check his record first. And Secretary Babbitt might consider having his staff spend less time on a spin website and more time on complying with this com committee's subpoenas. There is one more statement that the Secretary has been making that I want to comment on. Here's what he told the Minneapolis newspaper, quote, basically you had eight or ten people, all of whom agreed that the application was going, was going to be denied or did not disagree with the emerging solution. Not a single one of them, end quote. The documents seem to tell a different story. I have no doubt that when we hear from a number of Interior Department employees tomorrow, they will all say that they supported the July 14, 1994 decision. The documents, which came to us only after a subpoena had been issued, seemed to tell a different story. The Interior Department had always followed one set of rules and then changed in midstream. The Interior Department turned over several lengthy, detailed reports prepared by career Interior Department staff, all of which supported the application. As late as June 1995, one month before the application was rejected, the Indian Gaming Management staff wrote a 22-page memo in support of the application. It stated that, quote, the proposed acquisition would not be detrimental to the surrounding community, end quote. The Interior Department could not produce one single memo laying out substantive reasons for rejecting the application of the three tribes. Is it any wonder that this, that this whole matter has wound up in court? The Interior Department is supposed to serve Indian tribes. Here, the tribes were left in the dark. What emerges from the entire record of documents and depositions is disturbing. The Interior Department had a standard set of procedures that they had used whenever they reviewed an application for off-reservation gambling. They were following these procedures. When Patrick O'Connor, a lobbyist for the wealthy tribes and a former DNC treasurer and DNC trustee, started contacting the president, Vice President Gore, the chairman of the DNC, Don Fowler, Clinton Gore Finance Chairman Terry McAuliffe, and Secretary Babbitt's staff, the landscape started to change. Patrick O'Connor personally spoke with the president at an April 24, 1996 fundraiser in Minneapolis about this manner and the president immediately asked his senior aide, Bruce Lindsay, to respond to Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Lindsay called the White House from Air Force One that very day, and despite the warnings of White House Indian Affairs aide Loretta Avent that this was a hot potato, too hot to touch, Harold Ickes called O'Connor. Conveniently, Mr. Ickes does not recall much of anything about the contacts in this manner. Much of what has been asked of Mr. Ickes, he simply doesn't recall. Mr. O'Connor's partner and longtime friend of the president, Tom Schneider, 
held a fundraiser which raised $420,000 on the night before the July 14, 1995 decision was made. Mr. Schneider does recall talking with Harold Ickes and asking him to follow up on O'Connor's request in May 1995. Mr. Schneider has previously testified that he and Ickes had a relationship such that, quote, if he said he was going to do something, he would do it, end quote. So is it any surprise that the three applicant tribes were never given a chance to address any deficiencies in their proposal? This is required by law. Why weren't they allowed to fix any of the problems in their application? Five different reviews of this proposal by the career staff failed to find specific, quote, detriment to the surrounding community, end quote. This is a key test of the law. The emails going back and forth among the staff in the summer of 1995 made it clear that under the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, this application should not be rejected. So they went hunting for another basis. Secretary Babbitt's people had made up their mind that this application was going to be rejected. They just had to come up with the right justification. It was well established Department of Interior policy that opposition to gambling in the local community was not enough to reject an application. However, that is exactly the grounds on which they rejected it. They flaunted their own policies. It is not just me saying that. There is a lawsuit pending in federal court in Wisconsin. The losing tribes have sued the Interior Department. This is what Judge Barbara Crabb said last March. Quote, there is considerable evidence that suggests that improper political pressure may have influenced agency decision making, end quote. This is a judge who was appointed by President Carter. The Justice Department is defending the Interior Department in this lawsuit. We have received a copy of a memo written by one of the career U.S. attorneys working on the case. After reviewing the same record we have just reviewed, that lawyer raised serious concerns with how the department followed their own procedures. So you have a judge appointed by a Democratic president and a lawyer in the Clinton Justice Department acknowledging that the Interior Department's actions are suspect due to possible political interference. It is clear that there was local opposition to this casino, as there often is in these cases. You will hear my friends on the other side of the aisle say that the local congressman, a Republican, Steve Gunderson, but that is not what is at issue. The department's own guidelines state that local opposition by itself is not sufficient to justify rejecting a, a casino as was expressed in other new department records that we have received. I am not an advocate of expanded gambling. I have frequently opposed legalized gambling. However, these hearings are not about gambling. Tomorrow, we're going to allow one of the local opponents of the casino to testify. Probably tomorrow evening, or I think, or is it tomorrow evening? Tomorrow, tomorrow afternoon. However, in all honesty, this is not about whether or not there should be a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. It is about whether federal agencies are going to allow their decisions to be based on political influence and contributions. That's the bottom line. I want to address one final issue before I yield to my friend Mr. Waxman for his opening statement. Yesterday, Mr. Waxman and I received a briefing from the Justice Department on the free memo to the Attorney General, which we heard about in our previous hearing. As you will recall from our final hearings of 1997, Director Free wrote a 22-page memo to Attorney General Reno urging her to seek an independent counsel. We have agreed not to discuss the contents of this memo, but I think that I can fairly say after having received the briefing that I believe Director Free was right in making his recommendation. The memo supports what we learned in last month's hearings when Director Free testified about this recommendation. The independent counsel statute requires, a specific, requires specific information from a credible source that high-ranking government officials may have violated the law. When that exists, or when the Attorney General has a personal, financial, or political conflict of interest, the law calls for her to apply for an independent counsel. The briefing given to Congressman Waxman and myself yesterday confirmed that, in fact, Director Free's recommendation relied on these two reasons. I now yield to my colleague for his opening statements. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. As we begin a new year of hearings, it's an appropriate time to reflect on where this committee has been, where we are, and where we're going. For two years, our committee has focused nearly all of its attention 
investigating the real and imagined scandals relating to President Clinton. In 1996, the committee held a series of hearings relating to the White House Travel Office and the FBI file fiasco. Although those hearings uncovered no illegal activity, they launched a barrage of unsubstantiated ac accusations. The most colorful, that the White House kept an enemies list, that it used the IRS to punish political enemies, and that the White House was a haven for hard drug users. These were all widely reported. All were completely false and the accusers never backed up their accusations with proof. But because of the way these things seemed to work, that was never reported. Our committee has been the leader in creating a new species of congressional oversight. The basis for an accusation is no longer limited to whether something actually happened. The new standard is that it could have happened. Then the burden shifts to the accused to disprove it. Last year yielded a bumper crop of sensational theories and banner headlines. The White House was accused of altering its videotapes by our chairman and selling burial plots at Arlington National Cemetery for campaign contributions. Former Energy Secretary Hazel O'Leary was accused of demanding charitable contributions from Johnny Chung. Maggie Williams was accused of soliciting campaign contributions in the White House. All are completely untrue. But again, it was the smear, not the truth, that captured the headlines. Campaign finance violations should be investigated by Congress, and it's indisputable that both Republicans and Democrats abused the system in 1996. I think Senator Thompson's investigation clearly demonstrated that and the value of uncovering wrongdoing. But our committee has failed in every way to pursue a credible investigation. To date, Chairman Burton has issued 813 subpoenas and information requests. Only 10 have been sent to Republican targets. We have received over 1 million pages of documents. 98% of that total comes from Democratic sources. The roots for this type of congressional oversight date back to the strategy devised by a fellow named Joe Gaylord, Speaker Gingrich's top advisor. He urged congressional Republicans to try to, quote, indict the Clinton administration and get the Clinton administration under special prosecutor problems. This message was reinforced in the infamous Ginny Thomas memo. Her 1996 directive instructed all Republican committee chairmen to focus their attention on any ethical lapses in the Clinton administration so that the Republican leadership could determine an agenda. Which brings us to today. The first question is why a hearing today during a recess and days before the President's State of the Union address? The explanation is hard to miss. On December 18, 1997, a front page story in Roll Call, a newspaper here on Capitol Hill, entitled Burton Slate's Pre-State of the Union Hearings to Tweak Clinton. This newspaper under that headline reported the following. House Government Reform and Oversight Chairman Dan Burton's campaign finance hearings will resume on January 20, 1998, just in time to embarrass President Clinton on the eve of his State of the Union address. Now, as the Chairman is fond of saying, that isn't me saying that. Two Republican committee sources said the timing of the next round of hearings was meant to turn up the heat on the President before his January 27 speech. Obviously, this is a political strategy, said one GOP committee aide. We won't let Clinton stand up and say all is sunny when he has done everything he can to block this investigation. In other words, 
This hearing isn't a search for truth. It's part of a deliberate strategy to score partisan points. Now, along those lines, the chairman attacked Secretary Babbitt for talking to the press and even having a website. Well, the chairman has been speaking to the press for over a year, and he has a website. The chairman attacked Mr. Ickes, but he didn't even bother to invite Mr. Ickes to come and testify or to give a deposition or to tell his side of the story. Evidently, it's easy to, to attack people uh, when they're not around. You'd like your target to be defenseless. So he objects when they put up a defense. In an effort to make sure that the hearings had balance, I asked the chairman to invite eight witnesses. I included George Skabeen and Mike Anderson, both from the Interior Department, because it seemed obvious that they were indeed at any hearing on this matter. They were instrumental in the Hudson Casino decision and are essential to understanding what happened. And I applaud the chairman for including them. Unfortunately, the chairman did not grant my request to include Hilda Manuel, who is Bureau of Indian Affairs Deputy Commissioner and the most senior career employee involved in this issue. I also requested Wisconsin's Governor Tommy Thompson, former Representative Steve Gunderson, State Representative Sheila Harsdorf, and County Board Supervisor Nancy Berrigal. They're all Republicans and locally elected officials who oppose the casino and would be invaluable in providing a complete picture to our committee on this matter. Although Chairman Burton initially refused my request, yesterday he belatedly invited Supervisor Berrigal to testify, but he's insisting that she appear at the end of tomorrow's hearing. That makes no sense. She is here today. She should testify with the witnesses today to give some balance, and the other four government officials should also appear. Chairman opened this hearing by commenting on an exhibit on the wall. I didn't bring that exhibit. Citizens from Hudson, Wisconsin brought that exhibit. And they're here today because they want to tell their side of the story. But they haven't been permitted to testify, and their one representative is being put on at the end of tomorrow, when maybe the press won't be paying so much attention. And it further inconveniences her because she has to be back home by tomorrow night. Well, the chairman and his staff seem to have their own rule of political correctness. Today, they want to tell a story. Their story is that three Indian tribes, today's first panel, were victims in the casino decision and were abused by the White House and Democratic Party politics. Because this is a story, not fact, any information that contradicts this theory isn't permitted. So we can't hear from Governor Thompson, who could explain why he opposed the casino, or former Representative Gunderson, who led the congressional fight against the casino, because what they have to say doesn't fit in with the story. If Congressman Gunderson testified, it would be immediately apparent that his views were thoughtful, reasonable, and compelling. Because he represented Hudson in Congress, he has a deep knowledge of this controversy. His motives are unquestioned, and he reached exactly the same conclusion as the Interior Department. If he testified, it would be nearly impossible for the chairman to impugn the administration. The chairman subjects potential witnesses to a very clear litmus test. If your information helps the theory of the day, you're in. If it hurts, you're out. If Representative Gunderson or the others testified, we would learn that the story of the Hudson Casino does not begin with our first witnesses, and that this isn't a case of impoverished, uh, naive Indian tribes versus wealthy, politically, politically sophisticated Indian tribes. If they testified, we would learn that this is all a fiction and that this fiction can only be sustained by ignoring the record. 
we would learn that the real beginning of the story isn't with the tribes, but with a man by the name of Fred Havenick and an organization called the Southwest Florida Enterprises. Fred Havenick and Southwest Florida Enterprises are the engine behind the story. It was Mr. Havenick's company that surmounted local opposition and successfully pushed through no, new zoning rules so that his dog track could be located in Hudson, Wisconsin. And when that truck track lost money, as everyone seemed to know it would, it was Mr. Havenick who conceived the idea of a Las Vegas casino right there on the premises. But because that wasn't permitted under Wisconsin law, he had to find a loophole. So he began shopping around for an Indian tribe. The tribe was essential because if it acted as a front, he could exploit a federal exception that permits Indian gaming. That loophole would allow the Southwest Florida Enterprises to circumvent the local opposition and the state law prohibiting casinos. So much for the Republican idea that local people ought to make these decisions. We would have heard that view articulated by some very prominent Republicans like the governor of the state and the former representative of the area, Congressman Gunderson. Now, when local opposition intensified and Mr. Havenick found this tribe to front for him, that tribe backed out. So he went shopping again. And on this trip, he found three tribes that comprise our first panel. When all the facts are in, I believe we will see that the decision in this matter was made by career Department of Interior officials on the merits and without political interference. In other hearings, I have been critical of the easy access Johnny Chung enjoyed uh, and for the White House's long delay in getting us the fundraising videotapes. I will be critical when it's appropriate, even of this White House and this president. But the record in this case doesn't justify criticizing the White House or the Interior Department. We've taken the depositions of numerous Interior employees, including the career employees most involved in the decision, and none indicated any political interference or improper conduct. I sympathize with the pro-casino tribes and their economic plight. They and Mr. Havenick have raised a legitimate question as to whether every procedural step was executed properly. And in fact, they're suing the Interior Department on exactly this basis. And I don't claim to be an expert in this area, but my reading of the record indicates that there could be some deficiencies. Whether those are major problems or insignificant technicalities, is for the courts, not the Congress, to decide. But that's an entirely different issue, however, than political corruption, which is the focus of this hearing. And I have seen nothing in the record that provides any support for believing that campaign contributions determine the Hudson Casino decision. The tale of the Hudson Casino is rich with two of Washington's most enduring traditions. We have lobbyists taking credit for the morning sun and a decision maker who doesn't want to be blamed when he says no to a friend. <clears throat> but the entire capital would have to shut down if that starts qualifying as criminal behavior. Mr. Chairman, at the conclusion of my statement, I'm going to make two motions. The first is a motion to call Governor Thompson and Congressman Gunderson, State Representative Harsdorf, and Hilda Manuel as witnesses. These hearings have little credibility if they're not included. Second, for over six months, I've requested that you investigate the $50 billion tax break Speaker Gingrich and Senate Majority Leader Lott sponsored for the tobacco industry in last year's budget bill. As you know from my letters, Haley Barber, the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, lobbied this issue for the industry, and the cigarette companies were the number one contributors to the Republican Party. 
when you rejected this request in the past, your rationale was that no foreign money was involved in that scandal. And you were focusing our hearings on foreign money. But the fact is, Mr. Chairman, there's no foreign money involved in the Hudson Casino issue. Your rationale for this hearing is that corruption, the selling of public policy for campaign contributions took place. I believe that that same rationale should lead us to get the facts about the tobacco industry, its contributions to the Republicans, and the subsequent action to sneak in a $50 billion tax break for the tobacco industry by two Republican leaders in a budget bill where no one ever knew what they were doing. The $50 billion giveaway to the tobacco industry is indistinguishable from today's hearing. In fact, the only difference in the matter is the industry's contributions and the benefit they received dwarf today's subject. Accordingly, I'll have a motion to subpoena information from the Republican National Committee, RJR Tobacco, the Philip Morris Company, Haley Barber, Speaker Gingrich, and the Majority Leader Lott regarding that matter. Mr. Chairman, you closed your comments by uh, reporting about a confidential briefing that both of us received regarding the memo that uh, FBI Director Free had submitted to the Attorney General. I was at that briefing yesterday, and that briefing was uh, about a memo that involves Mr. Free's interpretation of the law. His interpretation of the law was different than other people in the Justice Department's interpretation, and his interpretation was not the one accepted by the Attorney General Janet Reno. What we have is a difference of opinion on the law. I heard nothing other than the fact that the uh, FBI director thought that, based on his reading of the law, there should have been an independent investigator. That was his reading as the Attorney General testified and has said to the press on uh, several occasions. She uh, listened to his views, but it was her decision, and she made her decision on what she thought the law uh, specified. Mr. Chairman, I uh, have uh, before us a um, motion that I've indicated to you, and I'd like to move at this time that the committee subpoena uh, or at least invite Governor Thompson, former Representative Gunderson, State Representative Harsdorf, and Hilda Manuel as witnesses so that we can have a complete picture in the four days in which you're going to hold hearings on this issue from those who have something to say that I think is very important. And I uh, offer a second motion that we subpoena uh, information from the Republican National Committee, RJR Tobacco, the Philip Morris Company, Haley Barber, Speaker Gingrich, and Majority Leader Lott with respect to the $50 billion giveaway to the tobacco industry that they all promoted. I ask for consideration of these motions. I've been informed by our counsel, uh, Mr. Waxman, that uh, the only subpoenas or requests that can be made are those that are relevant to the hearings that are currently underway. So the latter memo would be, or the latter request, uh, motion would be out of order. Mr. Chairman, uh, on that point, I, I, I accept your ruling on it. I do want to, however, publicly call upon you to uh, issue those subpoenas and to follow that inquiry, which I think is as important as anything this committee has pursued. The chair will take that under advisement. Now, Mr. Waxman, you have the right under Clause 2K six of House Rule 11 to propose subpoenas of additional witnesses. Under House Rules, the committee must dispose of those requests. Uh, the committee will receive the requests completing the names of the proposed witnesses and the dates for their appearance. I will, before uh, this hearing, which spans four days, schedule a vote for those requests consistent with the rules. I don't think we'll do that right now, but, but we will vote on it later on. Mr. Chairman, uh, I do want to point out that I think it's important that we have these witnesses. I also want to point out with regard to the tobacco uh, issue 
I'm going to press that issue every time we hold a hearing uh, until uh, we get uh, that, uh, that issue brought before us. It's an important one. It's relevant to campaign finance abuses. And uh, I don't think that it ought to be swept under the rug if this committee's investigation is to have any credibility as being a fair inquiry into campaign finance. Would the, would the gentleman yield? Would the gentleman yield? The gentleman will state his point of parliamentary inquiry. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I want to be sure I understand your ruling. Uh, Mr. Waxman moved to invite Governor Thompson former colleague, Congressman Steve Gunderson, to other individuals. You indicated that you will put this motion to the committee before the conclusion of the four days of hearings that are scheduled on this matter. Now, it's self-evident that unless you do so at this stage, it's, it is very unlikely that these four individuals could testify before the committee, assuming that the motion passes. So I would like to inquire at what point you intend to put the motion to the committee. <clears throat> Mr. Lantos, the chair retains the right of recognition under the rules. The request made by Mr. Waxman is not privileged. Issues regarding recognition are not applicable. That's been the rule of the House since 1881. We will, as I said, vote on this uh, issue uh, at the proper time. And in, in the opinion of the chair, this is not the time to do that. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Gentleman has a point of order he wants I to do, make. I do Gentleman have a parliamentary it. inquiry. Gentleman will state it. The ranking member of this committee put a motion proposing to invite four public officials, including the Republican governor of the state in question and the former Republican colleague in whose district this gambling casino is, to testify. You have indicated that you will not now put the motion to the committee. My question respectfully is, at what point do you intend to do so? This is a democratic body. I am asking a proper question in a proper fashion. And I think it is your responsibility as the chairman of this committee to give a respectful and meaningful answer. I thought I did. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the answer is that we will vote on this motion, but we will not vote on this motion at this present time. Con continuing my parliamentary inquiry, Mr. Chairman, as I understand it, you have scheduled hearings on this matter today and tomorrow and next week on Wednesday and Thursday. May I inquire on which of those four days you intend to have this motion voted on? I'm not going to give you a definite time right now. All I will tell you is that we will vote on this motion uh, after all members of the committee have been informed. We don't have all of the members here right now. I want to make sure everybody is surprised of the motions and the ramifications of those of these motions. And so the chair reserves its right to have the vote at a proper time. And this is not the proper time. I have a I parliamentary we'll inquiry. The business Mr. Now. Chairman, I have a parliamentary Mr. inquiry Chairman, as well. May, may be recognized on this point. Perhaps, well, so does the gentleman can, have a parliamentary inquiry? No, I'd, I'd like to see if we can resolve this issue amicably. And I'd like to be recognized on that, uh, on the, in that attempt. The gentleman will, will state his position. Look, it would be a joke if we waited to the fourth day of our hearings before you brought this motion up because then it's going to be too late to ever include them in the hearing. If you're trying to make sure that the members have a chance to understand the matter and you get more Republican members so you can outvote us, I respect that. Now, you at least ought to put this to a vote today. And if you'll agree to do that, then, then I, 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 I will uh, understand and not push the matter to be considered at this moment uh, respecting the chairman's desire. Mr. We, chairman, we have that understanding. Mr. Chairman? Uh, does the gentleman have an inquiry you would like to make? Uh, yes, uh, I understand that uh, the courtesy was extended to the ranking member uh, to address briefly the wisdom of conducting a vote at the present time, and I wish just to make a brief point in the same vein. General State's point. Uh, there are a group of people, I take it from Wisconsin, uh, uh, who've joined us today uh, who uh, oppose the uh, 
dog track and the gambling operations in Wisconsin. Uh, I, I checked uh, with friends and relatives of my own who live in the in the area, and uh, they oppose the track as well. Uh, and I take it that if I were making the decision uh, with a view to vindicating the interests of uh, the community that I represented, I might have gone the same way. I would have said no dog track. Uh, but if we turn this hearing into uh, a relitigation of the wisdom of a dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin, I think, frankly, we are uh, getting very far afield from the purpose of our committee as well as the specific purpose of this investigation. And therefore, uh, I think today we should not uh, take advantage of the presence of our uh, witnesses on the first panel who represent uh, one of the competing interests in that decision because we're not here to ask them about the wisdom of putting a dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin. Uh, if we have the other side come up and tell us uh, that there should not be a dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin, then we've reduced this committee to the level of the career bureaucrats of Interior who were supposed to have made this decision in the first place. The only purpose for conducting this hearing, as I understand it, is to determine whether or not the uh, third of a million dollars in money that flowed from one of the interests in this uh, was on the level, uh, whether or not the Secretary of the Interior lied to the Senate of the United States, whether or not the President of the United States, Bruce Lindsay, Harold Dickies, and the Chairman of the Democratic National Committee were somehow involved in a dog track. When I worked in the White House in the Council's office, I can tell you we didn't do dog tracks. And so there is a way for us to investigate this that doesn't get us into the merits. And I think uh, we make a serious mistake in the conduct of this inquiry if we bring on uh, uh, witnesses who are going to testify to the merits of the decision whether to have a dog track in Hudson, Wisconsin. Gentlemen, yield to me. Uh, I, I, look. Well, the chair does not want Mr. to get Mr. Chairman, I have a parliamentary inquiry. Well, just one second. Uh, we will vote, Mr. Waxman, we will vote uh, today or tomorrow on your motion regarding the subpoenas so that if your motion prevails, there will be time enough for those additional witnesses to testify. So we will do that in a timely fashion. Regarding the people from uh, Hudson who are here, uh, I was advised by my counsel that uh, we didn't know they were coming, first of all. But second, that he met with them for what, over an hour? For over an hour and, and discussed this issue with them. Uh, because we already had our panel set, uh, we didn't want to muddy up the water, so to speak, by bringing these uh, additional panelists uh, before us. However, let me just say this. Uh, I said that we would uh, uh, bring, I believe the lady's name is Nancy Beragle. Is that her name, Nancy Barago? It's a pretty good pronunciation. We would allow her to uh, testify at the conclusion of the hearings tomorrow, but in order to accommodate the people from Hudson, uh, we will allow her to testify at the conclusion of the hearings today, so you can catch your plane if you need to go back. Now, I think that's being about as fair as we can be because we didn't know that they were coming. I understand their opposition, but I want to state once more that this hearing these series of hearings is not about whether or not gambling should be allowed, whether or not there should be a casino in Hudson, whether or not there should be a dog track in Hudson. I personally opposed legalized gambling when I was a state legislator in Indiana, and I still have that same feeling. This, these hearings are not about that. They're about whether or not political influence or campaign contributions altered the decision-making process. That's what it's about. But in deference to the folks from Hudson who have come here this long way, we will allow them to have uh, uh, Ms. Beragle uh, testify uh, this afternoon later on. Mr. Chairman, I, I want to, if you'd yield to me just on, on your time, I want express to express my appreciation to you. I think this is a fair resolution of the matter. I do want to point out that we wrote to you over a week ago asking that these people be invited to give their point of view. The witnesses we have today have no knowledge about what went on in the Department of Interior, they have strong feelings that they should have had the uh, decision go their way. Now we'll hear from people who had strong feelings it should have gone the other way. You can't divorce the decision by the Interior with the merits, both pro and con, because they had to make a decision on this very issue. Uh, that's what goes on all the time. So I disagree with Mr. Cox and I agree with the Chairman that we ought to have both sides presented to us on the, on the question of whether there should have been a, a casino right there in Hudson, Wisconsin, and, uh, and, and, uh, and whether the local people's wishes uh, should have been ignored. So I thank you for that uh, 
the resolution. I think it's a fair one. I look forward to having the vote. I hope we can get it today, but if you won't want to put it off for tomorrow, as long as we have a chance in the course of our hearings to uh, have these other witnesses included, uh, I would hope the members would uh, support our motion at, that, at the time the vote's put to them so that we can get even a more complete hearing on the matter. Thank you. Our first panel today is uh, individuals from the affected uh, tribes. Uh, we have Mr. Goshkabosh, Chairman Goshkabosh with us, uh, Chairman Arlen, Arlen Ackley Sr., and uh, George Nuago. Did I get those names correct? Would you gentlemen please rise, please? Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so I'll help you God? <clears throat> on behalf of the committee we want to welcome you here today uh, you are recognized to make opening statements uh, if you have longer statements than five minutes would you please submit those for the records and uh, I guess we'll start with you Mr. Gashkabash <coughs> Chairman Burton <coughs> Congressman Waxman distinguished congressional committee members ladies and gentlemen my name is Gashkabash I'm the chairman of the Couture Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians the Couture is located in rural northern Wisconsin. We have a membership of 5,250 enrolled tribal members. Over half live in off the reservation, largely because of lack of employment uh, opportunities. Following the treaties of 1837, 1842, and 1854, we were left with a reservation land base of 79,000 acres. Now most of that is lost with land ownership within our reservation being checkerboard. I've been privileged to serve my tribe as chairman of our tribal governing board during eight terms of office preceding my current term. I served two terms of office during the years of 1991 and 1995 as the elected president of the National Congress of American Indians, the nation's largest intertribal organization. NCI counts as its members most of the Native American nations within the United States and Alaska. In that capacity, I've played an ongoing role in the development of national tribal game and policy and became quite familiar with the, with the applicable policies and procedures. I want to see this work for all tribes. Improvement of economic conditions with tools for self-development is the principle behind the Indian Game and Regulatory Act, or IGRA. I want to see the benefits of IGRA principles achievable by our tribe and the two small tribes, also the Chippewa Nation, we have allied ourselves with as to the development of the proposed Hudson Project. I have learned, however, that politics is not only the development of sound policies, but diligence in seeing that they are not abused. Four Feathers was formed in 1993 in order to acquire a dog track facility near Hudson, Wisconsin, and convert the, the facility to a tribal economic development featuring a casino. Three of the four Feather partners are Indian tribes, Mole Lake Sakagan, Lacoudere, and Red Cliff Bands of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians of Wisconsin. The fourth partner is the current owner of the dog track, Croyland Properties, which would transfer the facility along with the surrounding real property to the tribes and further provide initial capital financing to the partnership. Le Couture was the first of 11 Wisconsin tribes to sign a Class Three gaming compact with the state of Wisconsin under the Indian Game and Regulatory Act of 1988. Immediately after signing, and result in approval of the gaming compact between Le Couture and the state of Wisconsin in 1991, we conformed our modest casino within our small community to compact terms and commenced the search for a sec suitable second location site to conduct Class Three gaming casino outside of the exterior boundaries of the reservation. Le Couture was diligent to include language in the compact that addressed the need for an additional site to meet the financial needs of the tribe. Page three of the Gaiman Compact with the state of Wisconsin, section three defines tribal lands as all lands within the state of Wisconsin, which may be acquired in trust by the United States for the benefit of the Couture Band of Lake Superior Chippewa Indians after October 17, 1998, over which the tribe exercises governmental power and which the re requirements of section 20 of the act, 25 United States Code, section 2719. The Couture is located in rural northern Wisconsin. The entire region is economically depressed. Duluth Superior is located approximately 100 miles northwest of Le Couture. Minneapolis-St. Paul is approximately 150 miles southwest of Le Couture. The major industry in Sawyer County and the area surrounding Le Couture are logging and tourism. Le Couture is not adjacent to any large metropolitan area. 
Much of the available work is seasonal, is seasonable. Le Couture unemployment rate fluctuates from 45% in the summer months to over 65% in the winter months. Employment for our tribal members and economic development for Le Couture is a high priority for our tribe. With decreases in federal and state grant dollars, the tribe must become more self-sufficient in order to meet the needs of its members. There are approximately 2,025 tribal members that have relocated primarily to seek employment and develop a better standard of living and now resides elsewhere. This migration appears to have accelerated in light of the strict welfare rules and reform that are in place in Wisconsin. Le Couture, due to decades of federal cutbacks, has had to do more with less to develop a growing tribal economy. Currently, Le Couture has a real shortage of safe, decent housing, homelessness with three or more single adults living together in order to make ends meet is common practice in our reservation communities. There is no housing for single adults. The waiting list for tribal members desiring one and three bedroom home is well over 100 members or 100 families. It is estimated that the cost over $5 million is needed to provide decent housing for our members. Education is a top priority for our tribe. Children of Lakutare attend either the public school system or the Lakutare Ojibwe K-12 school system. Over 450 students, or 23% of Lakutare youth, attend the public schools. The LCO school has a student population of 306 students. In 1995, the BIA condemned the portable classroom, uh, elementary classrooms necessitated because of outdated facility. Yet it did not provide ade uh, adequate funds to construct a new elementary K-6 facility. $2 million was provided and construction was started in 1997. However, the building sits vacant with no funds to complete the project. Mr. Estimated Kosh, uh, we want to stick as close to the five-minute rule as possible. We will try to give you some additional time from our side uh, when we uh, get into the question and answers. So we'll get back to you in just a moment to finish your statement. Uh, Mr. Thank Ackley. you, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Ackley. <clears throat> uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Arlen Ackley. I'm the tribal chairman for the Sakak and Chippewa tribe in Bow Lake, Wisconsin. I was debating here this morning whether I should read my uh, statement or not. In previous testimonies and other houses uh, for appropriations, I've submitted my, my comments to the committee and they accepted them for the record. And I would like to do that also here this morning, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, and you may speak extemporaneously if you like. Thank you very much, sir. I was listening to the, the, your, your debates this morning and, and it strikes me sometimes as a, as a tribal leader, the of the partisan politics I've seen over the years as a tribal leader that as a, as a native person we have to deal with whoever party is in power. So we don't have the privilege at times to look at what we can or can't do with what's happening with, with the acts of Congress. We try to implement in good faith the, the rules and regulations that are handed down through the different agencies. We try to comply with all different uh, federal laws that are, that are out there and spelled out for us. When we got involved as a tribal uh, community uh, to uh, look at the Hudson proposal that was uh, presented to the uh, governing body by Mr. Havanick and the, and the surrounding tribes, I personally contacted the other tribal leaders and asked if there was going to be any objection to my tribe participating in the uh, acquisition of this dog track for the benefit of our tribal members so we could have some kind of economic relief. In my statements in, uh, that I've submitted, our, our tribe is, is grown by leaps and bounds, and we have a, a huge population of, uh, of youth growing there. And we don't have adequate funds to, to fulfill all the basic needs that our tribal community needs that is growing that way. Several times I've come in the last few years and asked for governmental support for a continuation of our housing program and needs that we have to, to meet those basic needs of our tribal membership on reservation. A lot of our tribal members on all reservations of Wisconsin have returned back from the bigger cities after the Relocation Act has failed and the people come back looking and demanding jobs and different services from our tribal governing bodies. We just can't meet those kind of needs without the adequate support from Congress and the, the, uh, the support of the treaties that our government has assigned over the years. And we need all the help that we can get. Gaming was going to be an avenue that the Congress had supplied for us to look into uh, being self-sufficient. Unfortunately, for our tribes in the northern part of Wisconsin, that, that reality hasn't come there yet. We have uh, uh, substantial employment from the, the previous uh, years of where we'd have been depressed, but we need a lot of work and a lot of help. So I'm, I'm listening to your, your uh, gentleman's debate, and I appreciate your concern, and 
Um, over the years, we've, uh, we've come to rely on Congress quite a bit. Hopefully that uh, the questions and answers that go on in this hearing today will give you some light of what happened to us in the application of this Hudson project. I don't know if I can be in any assistance to either party, but I felt somehow that um, by participating here and with your committee staff members when they came to Wisconsin to ask us what happened to us, what I wanted to cooperate fully. I was a little shocked and disturbed when my attorney called me at home Friday evening and told me I was going to get subpoenaed to come here. As a tribal member, any time Congress would call me as a tribal leader, I would come willingly, openly, without being subpoenaed. So it, it kind of frightens me that I have to uh, look at the resources I have, have an attorney represent me because I don't know exactly what will happen to me by, by appearing here in front of a, a committee. So I would like to express my concerns that way and I hope you understand what I'm saying as a tribal leader. Anytime any one of you gentlemen would want to ask me a question, I'd be freely, openly, honestly talk with you. I, I believe as a true government to government relationship that we need to do that. So I'm here today to cooperate any way I can with both parties to see if I can help you understand what happened with us. I understand the city of people here from Hudson that oppose the, the expansion of, a, of what they consider gaming in their, their uh, respective community. We haven't written, uh, addressed all those concerns, but we had met with the elected leadership there in the city, and when uh, we, we talked with them, so we could proceed. So we're trying to cooperate every way we can. I watched this uh, application go from the uh, agency area to Washington, D.C. Central to come to know that um, we, we got rejected for whatever reason. I think it's all within these documents here. But I've never, as a tribal leader, seen the central office overrule the area director after they thoroughly investigated the application. Denise Homer, who was the uh, area director at the time in Minneapolis, came and visited my reservation personally, her and the uh, area superintendent. They toured my facilities. They said that uh, they would consider our, the application process. They, they looked at what we needed financially, and uh, they said they would try to give a favorable recommendation. They did that. There were the people there on, with the hands-on experience in the local area. The people from Washington, D.C., after we've been uh, rejected, some of them, people finally came to our area to look and see what Hudson was all about. And the economic benefits from the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act could have helped our people. So with that, <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I appreciate the, the time this morning. And uh, any thing I can do for you, just well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the question in a moment. But just let me just say, uh, Mr. Ackley, that uh, you or any of the panelists have nothing to fear at, as long as uh, you're truthful with us. And the reason we sent the subpoena is to make sure that the panelists uh, did appear. It was not, we, you weren't being selected and you have nothing to fear. I understand, uh, sir. Mr. Nuago. Yes, uh, good morning. I guess I, I came to this committee with uh, a lot of the concerns and, and not truly understanding what anybody would like to hear, but I'm here to talk about the truth that, that I know and, and the involvement that I've had. And. Um, Congressman Waxman talked about uh, where this all began, this process, and it began with Mr. Havnick in Miami, Florida. I don't believe that, that that is the case. This whole issue began when people from, from this Congress or, or a part of this Congress voted on IGRA and passed this, this law. And the Senate voted on it and passed this law and provided Indian tribes the opportunity to um, step out beyond uh, their their um, reservation boundaries and and put land into trust for the purpose of gaming. Uh, I, I believe even the Supreme Court ruled on that that particular issue. That's where this began, and I think that that we viewed this as an opportunity that Congress had provided to us, and we took it upon ourselves to see the possibilities of of economic prosperity. Uh, that other tribes had experienced in the state of Wisconsin and in other places that, that you all have the opportunity to see quite regularly. I am the chairman of one of the poorest tribes, not one of the poorest tribe in the state of Wisconsin. I don't have the opportunity to fly to Washington, D.C. to shake your, your hand or, or your, your aide's hand or, or anybody in your office. I don't have that luxury. I don't have that opportunity. 
But this process began a long time ago when, when you provided that opportunity. And um, I want to mention that uh, it is my understanding there is a trust res responsibility that this government has to, to Native people, one of which I am. And the agencies that, that um, work on behalf of whatever administration is in power has that trust responsibility to me as a Native person and is required to look out for the best interest of me at times. It, it's kind of humorous, and I was talking to these gentlemen this morning, that I have 15,000 acres of land on a reservation. I have to get permission from the Bureau of Indian Affairs to cut trees down on my land. That's the, that's the responsibility the Bureau of Indian Affairs has for me. And uh, we, we went through this this process. We took the steps that, that this agency laid out and that Congress had laid out. We followed the steps. We followed the rules. And uh, in fact, we were planning to open a casino in Hudson, Wisconsin. We were led to believe that our application was sound and it was good and that we were going to uh, enjoy in some of the benefits of gaming. I sit in my office uh, day after day and I have, I have tribal members that come into my office and they ask me for my assistance. And a lot of times they, as, as a lot of people think, because we have a casino, we're making multi-millions of dollars and I'll, I'll guarantee you that the Red Cliff Tribe is not making millions of dollars. We employ 100 people and that's what our casino does. But I have these people come in with genuine concerns medical issues that, that they want to get addressed and need help in. As a matter of fact, I had my cousin come in to me and he says, George, I, I need some help. My little girl needs to get corrective surgery on her legs. Can you help me out and give me some money so I can go with her? I said, gee, I, I can't do that, but I'll tell you what we can do. I can, I can offer you a, a volunteer bingo. You can have a volunteer bingo. So we did that and, and he got his family together and they had a little bingo and they raised themselves a couple hundred dollars. So he could go with his daughter and be by her when she had this operation. My health needs aren't being met through this trust responsibility that this government has for me. Our contract health dollars through IHS overexpended $277,000. I don't have no way of getting. Now, when I go up to Bemidji and talk to the people up there, IHS, to help me out, they're, they're, not, they're not providing me any of the assistance. This was an opportunity that you gave to me so I could, could access some of the revenue of gaming. And I was hoping I was going to partake in that. The other comment I want to make is that there is thousands and thousands of pages of documents. And anybody can extract one sentence out of these thousands of pages and make it say what they want it to say. But when you look at this packet, and I hope that everybody truly does, look at it in its entirety to find out whether or not there is truly truth being given here. Because we as citizens a lot of times put everybody up on this moral uh, plateau and think that they should do no wrong. There is some wrong that's being done. And I, I come here being engulfed in this whole process. I am so removed from my element right now that, that, it, that it's a bit frightening. I get a bit shaky. But... Um, I am here to cooperate in any, any manner that I can, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for your statement. Uh, we'll now go to the questioning. I'll recognize uh, my chief counsel, Mr. Bennett, for 30 minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Goshkabosh, Mr. Ackley, and uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Nuwago, um, to the extent that you want to make additional statements, uh, I'll certainly yield a portion of my time to allow you to do that, Mr. Goshkabosh, in, in a few minutes if we can. Uh, I think it's fair to state in terms of uh, Chairman Nuago's comments that, uh, and in the statements you all have submitted that uh, clearly the issues of unemployment and alcoholism and, and drug abuse have been rampant in your communities. Is that correct, essentially, for all three of you? Yes, that's correct. And uh, Mr. Ackley, in terms of my obligation as chief counsel for this committee to make sure there's full disclosure to all members, uh, you, sir, at one point in time had your own problem with alcohol or substance abuse. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And in, in fact, uh, in 1989, you sold two ounces of cocaine to an undercover agent. Is that correct, sir? Yes, sir. I'm a recovering alcoholic. 
and I don't say that, if you lean forward in the microphone, sir, I don't say that to embarrass you in any way at all, uh, but just in terms of an obligation to all members of this committee to understand uh, the background of all witnesses who appear before it. Mr. Nawago, sir, I'd also note that because you all are under subpoena, uh, this committee uh, pays for your travel expenses, so we've been able to assume your cost uh, for coming here today, and that's one of the reasons we wanted to make sure that you were under subpoena. Uh, all three of you are present with your attorneys. If at any point in time you feel that you have the need to refer to your counsel, uh, please let me know. Um, let me, again, Mr. Goshkabas, before we get into a more detailed statement by you of some of the other points you wanted to raise, let me ask, ha have any of you gentlemen ever been politically active? Uh, yes, counsel. Uh, I have been uh, politically active in the uh, in the uh, state party system and also the, uh, the, uh, the national party. And in fact, you at one time were a Republican candidate for the Wisconsin State Senate, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And you presently are still a registered Republican? No, I'm not. I got so disillusioned with both parties, uh, with the exception perhaps of one independent member that serves on this committee. I'm, I'm currently an independent uh, fence sitter. Now, Mr. Uh, Chairman Nawago, you are in fact a registered Democrat, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, Mr. Ackley, what is your political affiliation, sir? It's hard enough being politically active on the Molech Indian Reservation at this time of year, Mr. Bennett. But uh, before my conviction, I was a practicing Democrat. With respect to the, the undertakings uh, as to seeking to have a casino gambling in conjunction with the dog track already at Hudson, Wisconsin, uh, what studies were initially conducted uh, both in Ashland, Wisconsin, and also by the Minneapolis, Minnesota offices with respect to any impact on the community. And all three of you can feel free to speak with Mr. Goshkabas. Let me start with you, sir. What studies were uh, conducted? The, uh, the uh, partnership uh, uh, looked at uh, doing the very best we could because this was going to set a, a, a standard. This would be the first ever. And so we wanted to do a, a, a thorough job. And so we employed the services of, a, of economist, um, uh, uh, Dr. Murray, and also uh, Arthur Anderson's study. I, I would hope that the committee has that so that they could refer to that. And w had any of you ever dealt with any of the people in the Department of the Interior who ultimately came to be involved in this entire process? Uh, specifically uh, uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Michael Anderson, who ultimately signed the rejection letter on July 14, 1995. And we'll go through the chronology in a minute. But Mr. Nawago, had you ever dealt with Mr. Anderson before? Do you know Mr. Anderson? No. Mr. Ackley, did you know Mr. Anderson? I didn't personally know him. I, I was aware of his position as a, as a member for the National Congress of American Indians. Our tribe has been a member in good standing for a number of years. Mr. Goshkabash, did you know Mr. Anderson? Yes, Counsel. Uh, Michael Anderson... Uh, now, I'm referring to the Department of Interior individual uh, appointed to a political position by the president to ultimately sign the rejection letter on July 14, 1995. And with respect to that individual, what interaction had you had with him in uh, previous years, sir? Michael Anderson, uh, when I was president of the National Congress of American Indians from 1991 to 1995, Michael Anderson was employed and worked, worked directly under, under my leadership here in Washington, D.C., in an office. Uh, housed by the National Congress, and he was employed as the ex uh, executive director from uh, March of 1992 through uh, May of 1993 when he accepted an associate solicitor's position within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. With the Clinton administration? That's correct. Right. And would you have defined Mr. Anderson as having been a friend of yours? <laughs> um, an associate. Uh, I uh, worked... Uh, professionally with Mr. Anderson, and uh, he headed up our office here, and he, he, worked, uh, he worked very diligently on many issues. Uh, uh, probably, a night, I think the only major contention I had with Mr. Anderson was in 1992, when then Governor Clinton was running as a candidate for the President of the United States. Uh, Mr. Anderson was, was faxing out, and I was active in the Republican Party at that time, uh, 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 flyers on the Democratic uh, uh, meetings throughout throughout the country and uh, uh, faxing it over the National Congress's uh, fax lines and I basically uh, called him to task and, uh, and uh, asked him, uh, stated to him that uh, to be fair I think he should also fax out Republican uh, uh, flyers or information on the Republican Party so let the uh, tribal membership make an informed decision 
in choice on the candidates. Bottom line is you had a little bit of a dispute with Mr. Anderson, again, in terms of full disclosure to members of the committee That's prior to the matter of the Hudson dog track. That's correct. Uh, and indeed, sir, I believe you at one point in time applied for a position with the Clinton administration with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Is that correct? That's correct. Also. And w were you given that position? I was notified in, 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 uh, in uh, July of 1996 that uh, of, of eight candidates, I was the number one candidate and I was selected as, as the Minneapolis area director for the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And uh, 30 days after that, uh, I was uh, told that, uh, that uh, because of political pressure uh, coming from Congressman Obie and others uh, to Secretary Babbitt uh, and my political affiliation with the Republican Party that I was uh, no longer uh, uh, a candidate as a senior executive service employee. Have you had any further interaction with Mr. Anderson uh, politically other than those events? I met him several times occasionally, casually, and that was it. Uh, re returning to the matter then of the, uh, the dog track uh, and the proposed casino, uh, even prior to the Four Feathers partnership with your three tribes and Mr. Fred Havanek, who will testify this afternoon and was a witness requested by Congressman Waxman, uh, in fact, there already was a dog track facility in Hudson, Wisconsin, correct? That, that, that's correct. There is one as we speak. There's a dog track facility. That's correct. It's and, there, a there is, facility. and there's gambling, gambling that goes on at that facility. That's correct, Council. And so the entire question here is a matter of adding a casino in terms of gambling in a, uh, to a facility that already is engaged in gambling uh, at the Hudson Dog Track, correct? That's correct. Now, in terms of the initial application, when did you, uh, your tribes initially apply uh, to get the Class Three permit so that you could add casino gambling to the Dog Track facility? Mr. Ackley or Mr. Nawago, whichever one of you thinks you have the best knowledge on this, what would the date have been? I don't remember right now. I'd have to look it up. I believe that the court file, uh, in terms of the opinion of Judge Barbara Crabb, to which Chairman Burton made reference earlier, reflects that it started in October of 1993. Does that sound correct? Yes, that's correct, Counsel. And I know that we have some opponents of the casino gambling who are here today and are going to be accorded an opportunity to speak. Uh, and indeed, we also have some proponents who I think are going to come forward and speak. But with respect to the matter of adding casino gambling or not, I gather that there were supporters and opponents of this particular issue. It was a local issue, wasn't it? That's correct, Council. And with respect to this local issue, essentially how did the, the resolution of that play out on a local level in terms of whether or not you were going to be able to add casino gambling to the Hudson Dog Track? There was indeed a referendum, was there not, I think, yes. to which the chairman made reference? And the referendum, let me ask you this, because I was speaking with some of the opponents uh, a few days ago. The referendum was a fairly close referendum with the cities of Troy and Hudson, Wisconsin, ultimately resulting in a vote in favor of casino gambling. Is that correct, Mr. Goshkabash? Yes, that's correct, Council. And by, by the same token, again, in terms of fairness, the Hudson City Council itself had voted, uh, the members of the city council had voted four to two against the matter of casino gambling, hadn't it? That was after a change in the elected leadership in the mayor and the city, in the composition of the, uh, of the city council. What had been the position of the mayor of Hudson, Wisconsin, with respect to casino gambling? During this time, the mayor, uh, I believe it was Mayor Reeder, was very supportive of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the casino in Hudson. Once you uh, weathered that uh, political storm in terms of whether, in terms of opposition and or support in the referendum, uh, what steps did you take with respect to regulations with the Bureau of Indian Affairs to apply? And again, Mr. Goshkabas, if you want to make reference to your statement now in terms of the process you undertook, what steps were taken uh, to accord with all federal and state and local regulations? Well, according to, uh, according to IGRA... If you can bring the microphone a little closer to you, sir. First, did you, did you speak with the, um, the local agency office of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, specifically Mr. Jager in ha Ashland, Wisconsin? Yes, Counsel. If I could just refer to my sure, testimony go right ahead. on this, I would just like to read a paragraph from there, if I could. Go right ahead, sir. Uh, first, the Secretary of Interior must determine that gaming on a particular site is appropriate under 20, uh, 25 U.S.C. Uh, Section 2719, uh, which prohibits off-reservation gaming unless the Secretary, after consult uh, consultation with applying 
with the Appliant Indian Tribe and appropriate state local officials, including officials of nearby Indian tribes, determined that a gaming establishment uh, on newly acquired lands would be in the best interest of the Indian tribe and its members and would not be detrimental to the surrounding community, but only, uh, but only if the governor of the state in which the gaming activities to be conducted concurs with the secretary's determination. An emphasis added there. Uh, but we followed the steps, and the, the, the first step in that process was to, to put this application together. It was a very long, grueling process. Just, just three tribal uh, governments here, and I looked at the composition of your committee trying to work out details. Three tribal governments also had to work out numerous details <laughs> along with the non-Indian partner, and that was a, a, a very long, grueling process. But yes, and when we submitted our application, it went to the agency level, to the superintendent, uh, Robin Yeager. I believe there was a time frame, 30 to 60 days to respond. From Mr. Yeager, uh, I think that uh, it was submitted down then to the area office, uh, who also, there's under time frames, uh, had had uh, a, a time. And that would have been in Minneapolis, is that correct? The Minneapolis area director, that's correct. And the person you dealt with there was, I believe, a uh, Ms. Denise Homer, is that correct? That's correct, Council. Again, a career Department of the Interior employee? That's correct. Uh, did Ms. Homer reach the same result as Mr. Jager in terms of approving your application? It, it sat there for about a year, Council, because there was additional questions and concerns that were raised, and the partnership had to address those concerns, and uh, 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 maybe Mr. Ackley can address those, because I was so busy during that time uh, representing Indian country, but uh, I was informed of many of the issues that were coming up, but I remember, was it uh, uh, the environmental issue was one of the major hurdles? Right. And you dealt with those issues with the Department of Interior officials, both in Ashland as well as in Minneapolis? Well, we tried to, uh, the best we could with our staffs. Uh, I, I was coordinating the uh, uh, the, the tribal uh, planning department from uh, the, the three reservations and tried to meet uh, their uh, questions and concerns they had from the agency, sometimes from the uh, area director's office. And we even followed that when it got here to uh, Washington, D.C., that same scenario. But, uh, I was coordinating the other tribes and their attorneys and uh, communicating with Mr. Havanek and, and see if we could uh, help coordinate any information anybody along the process had that we could try to answer at the time. Incidentally, in terms of uh, proponents uh, for and people against the casino, uh, Chairman Burton and uh, Congressman Waxman received a letter recently from State Representative Barbara Linton. Mr. Chairman, I believe by reference to Exhibit 352, I don't want to violate my agreement with Congressman Lantos about not introducing exhibits, but I believe we could have this be an exhibit. Exhibit 352 is a letter from a State Representative, uh, Mr. Ackley, who I believe indicated support for the casino. Is that correct? I will submit that. Yeah, I've, I've met uh, Representative Litton a few times. And again, that was Excuse a me, Council, could we get a copy of that, please? I'm sorry? Do we, do we have a copy of that letter? I believe it's in, in the file, Congressman. Thank you. Yeah, I believe it already is. In terms of the, the particular uh, agreement with the City of Hudson, if we could have uh, Exhibit 351 placed on the, the screen here in the hearing room. And uh, perhaps, uh, Chairman Goshkabosh, if you could address uh, uh, for the members of the committee, uh, the matter of this service agreement specifically as to the benefits that were going to accrue to the city of Hudson, Wisconsin as a result of casino gambling being placed into uh, and in conjunction with the dog track. Uh, essentially, the, the, your three tribes were in fact to give a portion of the gambling receipts to the city of Hudson, Wisconsin, to make up for any tax loss by placing that property in trust to the federal government pursuant to the laws passed by Congress, thereby resulting in a tax loss to the community, uh, to offset that and even provide a profit to the city of Hudson, Wisconsin, there was to be money to go to the city from the proceeds. Is that correct, Chairman Goshkabosh? Yes, that's correct. Uh, we signed a service agreement that uh, in lieu of taxes, we were going to provide the city of Hudson in the, uh, in the county uh, approximately $1.1 million annually with a 5% increase uh, through 1999. And what was the approximate tax loss going to be to the Hudson, Wisconsin as a result of taking this property off the tax rolls and placing it in trust to the federal government pursuant to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act? Council, I'm going to guesstimate here. Uh, I believe Mr. Havanek would have the exact figures, but I, it was somewhere around $600,000 uh, annually. 
and with the 1.1 million, we were going to pay the uh, city and the county uh, a little, uh, around a half a million dollars. Uh, uh, in addition, over and above the, uh, the, ta the lost tax revenue. Directing your attention to the chronology in 1995, up to early 1995, up to February of 1995, were any of you advised of any problems with respect to the process of applying to have a casino here at the Hudson Dog Track? Council from La Couture, we, we were never notified during this Mr. Ackley. process. We'll get into the events in early 1995, but up to February 8, 1995, was there any uh, indication to you that there was a problem, that this was going to be rejected in any way? Not that I was aware of. Mr. Nawago, as to you, sir. No. Uh, directing your attention to early 1995, were any of you gentlemen aware of a meeting held on February the 8th, 1995, with the Minnesota congressional delegation and with Minnesota Indian tribes opposing your effort for economic reasons. Attended by Mr. George Scabine, who's due to testify here tomorrow, as well as Mr. Duffy from Secretary Babbitt's office. Were any of you aware of that meeting? I was made aware of that after the meeting was over. Well, let I, me uh, direct your attention to some exhibits here that might uh, assist you in that regard, uh, Chairman Ackley. I'll show you exhibit uh, 298, if we can, on the projection screen here in the hearing room. That is a letter uh, which you addressed to Secretary Babbitt sometime after March 3, 1995. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, in that letter, do you address the fact that you at some point in time learned about, uh, by the way, I note that letter isn't dated, but uh, it clearly uh, is sometime after March 3 because you make reference to your appearance here in Washington. Uh, do you address the question of not having been advised of such a meeting with Secretary Babbitt? Yes. I was pretty angry at the time. And I think that this letter also makes reference to um, the presidential order. And I'll ask it, three, uh, Exhibit 350 be placed on the projection screen as well. And uh, these are all in the exhibit packets, Mr. Chairman, for the members. Um, with respect to the requirement as set forth in President Clinton's directive of April 29, 1994, you noted in your letter to Secretary Babbitt that that order from President Clinton specifically provides that uh, executive departments shall consult to the greatest extent possible with tribal governments prior to taking in, uh, actions adverse to them. Um, are you aware of that provision as set forth in President Clinton's directive, Chairman Ackley? Yes, sir. And did you get any response from Secretary Babbitt in terms of clearly a failure to comply with that directive of the President? No. Let me, uh, if I can, specifically direct your attention um, to Exhibit 302, again on the projection screen here in the hearing room. And that, makes re that letter is from John Duffy, counsel to Secretary Babbitt. produced pursuant to subpoenas issued by this committee. And looking at that letter dated March 27, there is reference to, uh, as you may know, on February 8, 1995, then there's a discussion about the meeting with opposing tribes as well as members of the congressional delegation of Minnesota in terms of your application. There was apparently, and, and I believe Judge Barbara Crabb in the federal litigation, Mr. Chairman, in Wisconsin has made reference to this six weeks delay before you were notified. Mr. Ackley, did you have any knowledge of the meeting with the Minnesota delegation and Mr. Scabine and Mr. Duffy and tribes opposing your efforts for economic reasons uh, for a period of six weeks? How, when did you finally find out that there had been this February 8 meeting? I actually watched some of the tribal leaders uh, in Washington, D.C. I was, I was present here. Um, brings back my, my memory a little bit when I'm looking at the, at the letter, but at the time I was looking at uh, uh, the places and the, and the tribal leadership I recognized from the state of Minnesota and also from Wisconsin who was present here in Washington, D.C. And uh, I was concerned, and I still am, of, uh, of the meeting they've had with uh, respect to uh, Mr. Uh, Skabeen. Um, I had met with him uh, twice uh, during this process. 
Mr. Scabina had informed me when he just got appointed as the uh, uh, director for the uh, gaming management staff, and I uh, met with him uh, after he got settled in. And I was also present at a meeting when he informed me that he just left Mr. Duffy's office to extend the comment period. And I was pretty angry about that also. Did you, when you expressed that anger, did you ever ask Mr. Scabine why for a period of over six weeks no one had notified you about this meeting? Well, I was back and forth to Washington, D.C., and I kept trying to get some information, uh, looking for help, uh, what was going on, why wasn't I being consulted with. Uh, was there ever any explanation as to why you weren't notified of the meeting, apart from not being invited to the meeting, why you weren't even notified that there was a meeting? Was there ever an explanation of that? No. Um, at any time, did anyone from the Department of the Interior accord any of these three tribes, whom you gentlemen represent, any opportunity to cure any problems that may have arisen with respect to that February 8th meeting? Mr. Bennett, I was uh, made aware with Mr. Uh, Scabine's staff that the problem to place land and trust was going to become an issue uh, from his uh, um, observation of the application that the parcel of land that was going to be placed in trust might, uh, trust might be landlocked and that he wanted to uh, guarantee the tribes had access to the highway and that uh, there was a parking lot on the north side of the dog track, I believe, that uh, he wanted to guarantee that the, if the land was going to be placed in trust, then we needed to have access to the property. Otherwise, it wouldn't be done properly, and he wouldn't uh, do any credit to the tribes, and he wanted to make sure of that. That's the only concern that I re recollect that he had. Is that consistent with your recollection as well, Mr. Goshkabash? Yes, that's correct. And uh, when I was notified of this uh, by, by, uh, by Mr. Ackley and others involved in the project, uh, I was quite disheartened to, to learn that the... Uh, that, you know, that there was a closed meeting, but uh, that the process was reopened again, and we were never notified so that we could submit additional comments as well. Let, let me ask you this. Secretary Babbitt has made a comment to uh, the press recently uh, that he was, I think his words were, out of the loop with respect to the Hudson dog track question. But in fact, uh, I think, Mr. Ackley, you attended a meeting in, on or about April the 8th, 1995, when Secretary Babbitt was in Wisconsin, in Green Bay, Wisconsin, at the Radisson Hotel where the specific issue of the Hudson dog track was discussed. Isn't that correct? Yes, with the other tribal leaders of the area, right. And Secretary Babbitt was part of that conversation. Oh, yeah. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Let, let me just uh, try to maybe illuminate the issue a little bit. Uh, there, at that meeting uh, that we're talking about, there were lobbyists. There were people from the opposing tribes. Uh, there were people from the Department of Interior. Uh, and you were excluded, and you were the petitioning group, Indians, of group of Indians that wanted to have the casino approved. That's correct, right? Yes. But you weren't informed. No. The opponents were informed and were at the meeting, but you weren't. So it was over with, yeah. Okay, now let me ask you this. Up until that time, did you have any indication that your application was going to be rejected, or did you have an indication that it was moving along properly and was going to be accepted? The indication was it was moving along to be accepted. Was there any indication that you knew of prior to that meeting that it was going to be rejected? No. Mr. Bennett? Yes. Uh, continuing on with that, uh, and during the, the six weeks delay before you even knew about the meeting, and then directing the t uh, your attention up to around April the 8th, 1995, when Secretary Babbitt was personally in Wisconsin at a meeting at the Radisson Hotel and discussed this matter. Uh, again, continuing with the chairman's questions, was there any indication to you at that point in time that your application for the casino was going to be rejected? No, and he was quite clear that he wanted to steer away from discussing the application until it went through the uh, uh, gaming management staff personnel to make sure that it would, uh, he was talking to what from the knowledge he'd gained from those people overseeing the application. With respect to any in terms of trying to find what we'll hear about later in terms of a, a standard set by Congress in terms of whether there's detriment to the community or any other defects in your application, at any point in time, were any of the three of you advised that there was any particular defect in your application or a detriment to the community that you were given an opportunity to cure and correct any problems? Were any of the three of you ever so notified prior to July 14, 1995? Mr. Nawago. 
Mr. Ackley? No. Mr. Goshkabash? No. Directing your attention to the um, trips, I think, that you made reference to, Mr. Ackley, uh, in, in Washington, I believe that, uh, uh, let's reference, first of all, July 14, 1995, uh, the rejection letter signed by Mr. Michael Anderson. Did any of you receive any advance notice prior to actually receiving that rejection letter? Any of you? No. From La Couture, no. Uh, Mr. Ackley? No. Mr. No. Nawago? Redcliffe, no. Basically, after that rejection letter of July 14th, Mr. Ackley, you took some offensive to try to find out what happened, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Okay, and exactly what did you do, sir? Well, I contacted Loretta Vonta at the White House to see if, uh, if she could give me some kind of explanation of why we weren't consulted with in the first place. Can, can, can I make a, a statement? Sh certainly, sir. Go right ahead. I got elected as a tribal leader first in 1983, and I felt very privileged and honored to uh, be invited to the White House and listen to Mr. President Bill Clinton give us a, uh, a replica of metal on the South Lawn and to give us a speech about the consultation process. Because uh, prior to uh, us receiving that, that invitation, as a tribal leader, I've never been invited to the White House before. I've been to Washington, D.C. a few times. So we finally got to come to the old executive building and, and talk with somebody and Loretta Vaught was that person in the Indian office. And we had access, finally. And after I got the letter, I wanted to use that access to find out exactly what was happening within the administration. So I went there to find out if uh, somebody could give me an explanation of why I wasn't consulted with. After reading the, the letter um, and, and knowing that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was assisting us in the finding a no significant impact, which is called a FONSI, that uh, there was problems with the environmental concerns of our application without having the opportunity to correct them. No one ever gave, never ever notified you of that fact or gave you an opportunity to correct any alleged problems, correct? I didn't know that, sir, until I got the letter. Uh, directing your attention to, if I can, on the exhibit screen here in the hearing room, uh, exhibits 331, they're in the exhibit book, as well as then, first of all, as to 331, this is a, uh, uh, a memorandum that you sent to Mr. Loretta Avant in, on August the 3rd, about three weeks after the rejection, essentially noting the problems that you have just addressed here today. Isn't that correct, Mr. Ackley? Yes. And then I'll show you what, a, a document you may or may not have seen, uh, Exhibit 332. If we can have that on the screen here in the hearing room. That is a memorandum uh, for Mr. Uh, Ms. Avant that we received from the Executive Office of the President pursuant to a subpoena issued by the committee. And uh, if you want to take a minute to look at that, Mr. Ackley, have you seen that document before, sir? No. Essentially, it notes her trying to address the concerns which you have raised in August. All right. Let me ask you this, uh, Mr. Ackley. Um, ultimately, you had further interaction, didn't you, in terms of talking or meeting with Mr. George Scabine, the director of the uh, Indian Gaming Management Office, uh, who in fact is going to testify before this committee tomorrow morning. Uh, were you at a meeting which he attended uh, in December of 1996? Yes. And at that point in time, did Mr. Scabine offer any explanation as to why, with no notice to your tribes, with no indication of any defect in the application, suddenly at the last minute on July 14, 1995, the applications of all three tribes uh, were reje was rejected. Did uh, Mr. Scabine indicate to you any explanation of that? The explanation was, was out of his hands. It was people above him got too political for him to get, be involved with anymore. And specifically in terms of it got too political for him to be involved, what did Mr. Scabine say with respect to political influence in Washington affecting this decision? Well, I think what he was telling me was that he was coming out of John Duffy's office because that's where he came from when he, when he came back to uh, talk with me. Did Mr. Scabine make direct reference to political pressure? Oh, yes. I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Waxman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the three of you being here. 
I, I used to be chairman when the Democrats were in control of Congress of a uh, committee on health and environment, so I have a lot of personal knowledge about Indian affairs when it comes to health issues. I was the primary author of the Indian Health Improvement Act, sponsored the law on alcohol and drug abuse issues uh, with respect to the uh, Indian tribes, as well as uh, environmental issues that uh, gave the tribal sovereignty clear recognition. When I was a chairman of a, a, a subcommittee, uh, we didn't issue subpoenas. We always asked people if they'd come. Right. Uh, and only when they said they wouldn't come would we compel them to come with a subpoena. So I can understand, Mr. Ackley, your concern of having gotten a subpoena uh, in the, uh, in the uh, uh, served upon you. Uh, and I also want to say that Mr. Bennett raised some personal issues about you. I don't see what relevance they have to anything we're going on uh, discussing today. I don't know why it was even brought up. You, while I've concerned and share your concerns about the um, situation with your tribes and how you would be economically benefited if you would have been allowed to have your application approved for a casino, uh, I, I do want to raise the question that you weren't trying to build a Las Vegas style casino on your reservations. You were trying to do this uh, some 80 to 200 miles away in a small Wisconsin community that evidently didn't want that casino in their midst. Uh, because this is an off-reservation project, not an on-reservation project, your economic interests needed to be balanced against the uh, views of the local community. I have a map over there uh, that I'd like to draw your attention to. This map shows Hudson, Wisconsin, in the, in the western part of the state. A and I think it also shows the potential economic value of the Hudson site. As you can see, Hudson is very close to a um, major metropolitan area, Minneapolis. And as I understand it, if the dog track in Hudson were converted to a casino, it would be very valuable property because it would be so close to Minneapolis. Isn't that right? Isn't, it, isn't one of the appeals of the, of the location that would be, draw people from Minneapolis? Sure. Okay. Now, the map also shows where uh, you're located. I think it makes the point that uh, your tribes are not near the proposed gambling site, uh, Chairman Goshkabash, I believe your tribe is the closest of the three. As I understand it, your tribe is located over 80 miles away. Is that accurate? That's correct, uh, uh, Congressman. With, with, with the exception, we do have some trust land uh, that is probably about 40 miles away from there uh, also as well. But the main reservation is 80 miles away, correct. And Chairman Ackley and Chairman Nawago, I understand that your tribes are like located much further away. Uh, in fact, Chairman Ackley, I understand your tribe is nearly 200 miles away. Is that accurate? Yes. And uh, Mr. Nawago? About 185 miles. Okay. Now, off-reservation gambling is different than on-reservation gambling, and uh, it poses a lot of issues not present when you have an on-the-reservation gambling uh, proposal. First, uh, you get local opposition. If the Department of Interior approves the application for off-reservation gambling, it must take the land into, into uh, a federal trust. In other words, this means that the local people have no longer control over that land anymore. It's now federal land, as if it were a reservation. And the federal government decides all the issues uh, for that, instead of that community deciding uh, what uh, the, uh, what uh, they would permit. In other words, they could federal government could force a casino on a community that didn't want a casino by saying it's no longer under your control, it's under the federal government's control. Uh, and um, the, uh, a lot of people in Hudson didn't like that. You knew about that, Mr. Ackley, didn't you? Well, I, I, I view it as a little bit different, the, uh, the process. Mm -hmm could be explained that easy, but there's going to be a lot of concurrence with the governor and uh, it's an opportunity for the Chippewa uh, nations to uh, get some of their land back. Uh, my grandfather signed a treaty in Prairie du Chien. It's about uh, 100 miles south of that area. Mm -hmm. uh, we really we, uh, recently participated in the Mille Lacs decision in the state of Minnesota. There's uh, six Chippewa tribes from Wisconsin to exercise an off-reservation on fishing rights. So that map does a little justice, but it doesn't include the state of Michigan. 
that the Chippewa nations can freely go within state boundaries and exercise off-reservation hunting and fishing rights. But we're a little bit different than other tribes when it comes to the uh, perspective of where we feel we're comfortable with. We're not a conquered people, and uh, we, we, we freely go and, uh, to the other reservations and practice our religion and feel comfortable doing so. so Do you uh, disagree with the idea that, the, that there ought to be uh, consideration for what the local population might think because your tribe once occupied that territory and therefore you have a right to locate a casino if you wish it? Would that be your view? No. Um, I participated with the local politicians in looking at a service agreement for services that were, were going to place the, uh, the land in the trust uh, to offset the, uh, the, the loss of the taxes that were real to the, uh, the township. And that was part of the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act scheme of, uh, of looking at self-sufficiency and, and allow us to communicate with the other uh, units of government. Well, whenever you get an off-site, off-the-reservation site, you get a lot of concerns about the local people, but you can also get uh, concern by other tribes about gambling uh, because uh, it's competition for gambling that may be taking place on a reservation nearby. And so sometimes one Indian tribe will object to an off-site uh, situation uh, for gambling because uh, they've got their own on-reservation uh, uh, gambling. And in fact, this problem also confronted your proposal uh, the map shows that the St. Croix tribe was much closer to Hudson than any of the other three tribes you can see on that map. Uh, and this tribe opposed the project, and in fact, they paid for lobbying campaign against it because they feared the competition. Uh, Congressman, if I, if I might point out sure. um, that the St. Croix tribe's facility in Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, is a off-reservation site. Uh, that started out an application process as a class two gaming facility in which they were going to have bingo and uh, miraculously uh, turned into a class three facility as the process moved forward without consultation to my colleague Gosh Kabash, the chairman of the LCO tribe, which is located near that site. So you, you fear that their fear of competition was for their off reservation site, not to just That's correct. The, 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 the uh, criteria that we were to meet with respect to the 50 mile radius. Um, that the Bureau had imposed as part of the application process uh, encompassed uh, this, the Turtle Lake site, which is an off-reservation site. That land is put in trust. Well, whether it's an on-reservation or off-reservation site, what you have is somebody who's got gambling going and somebody new wants to come in and compete, and sometimes the people that have uh, the clear uh, 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 avenue for uh, customers don't want to share their customers. Now. Uh, Chairman uh, uh, Gosh I understand you've been on both sides of this issue, and in this case, you're supporting the off-reservation gambling. But isn't it true that in 1992, you opposed an off-reservation gambling proposal by the St. Croix tribe for many of the same reasons that I just described? I have no recollection of uh, of opposing anything on St. Croix. I, I, you know, I do know that uh, St. Croix. Uh, many of our members are intermarried with St. Croix members. In fact, we have St. Croix members residing on our reservation. Um, I, uh, the only thing that I ever pointed out to St. Croix was that they opposed, when they opposed us, the Couture never went on record opposing them when they placed the Turtle Lake uh, site into trust. Well, I have a, a copy of an August 18, 1992 letter you wrote to Governor Tommy Thompson of Wisconsin. In this letter, you write that your tribe adamantly opposes an off-reservation gaming facility that the St. Croix tribe proposed at Spooner, Wisconsin. And according to this letter, you oppose this facility for two reasons. First, you said, and I quote, the Spooner gaming facility is located too far from the St. Croix reservation to have any benef beneficial impact on the tribal community. And second, you were worried about the effect on your tribe's gaming facilities because you thought the region was becoming saturated. And I, and I can just quote from the letter, in reviewing the 1988 Indian Gaming Regulatory Act and our La Couturier, uh, State of Wisconsin Compact, along with the recommendations of the State of Wisconsin Task Force on Gaming, La Couturier should be protected by the 50 mile radius of which Spooner falls within. La Couturier feels strongly that you, as governor of Wisconsin, should protect La Couturier from 
this clear case of saturation. Now, isn't it true that your proposal for a gaming facility in Hudson was similar in important respects to the Spooner proposal, except the roles were reversed? Uh, in the Hudson case, you were trying to site a gaming facility within 50 miles of the St. Croix tribe and not vice versa. What do you say? Well, I believe at that time, and I don't have a copy of that letter here to see that, uh, but... Uh, you, you, you do have a copy right in front of you. Congressman, the older I get, the, the more blurred these faxes get uh, with, with all due respect. But right. I, yes, I did write this letter. And I believe that uh, at the same time, uh, uh, St. Croix already impacted us with the Turtle Lake site because they were drawing the same customers. They were busting customers up from Eau Claire, uh, Chippewa Falls, uh, and some of the other southern uh, uh, small towns and villages. What they wanted to do then was basically cut us off because Spooner's on the opposite side of Turtle Lake. And so that would virtually dry up that market. That's correct, I did do that. But my, my essential point is this, that when you get off reservation game, gaming sites, it poses a very different res, uh, issue than on reservation sites. And I think your letter makes a, a very persuasive case why these off reservation cases need to be carefully scrutinized and why they often, uh, on some cases anyway, shouldn't be approved. As I study this Hudson issue, I've learned that one of the misconceptions that a lot of people have is that this issue is uh, really a battle between two groups or of tribes. In fact, it's a lot more complex. It's probably more a battle between Mr. Havanek, the Florida gambling developer who owns the dog track, and the community of Hudson than it is a battle between the tribes. Who first uh, had the idea to turn the Hudson dog track into a Las Vegas-style casino? Congressman, Mr. If, if I can... Uh, Mr. Havanek or you all? If I can just take a step back in your earlier comments with respect to um, Chairman Goshkabash's position with regard to the proposed uh, operation by St. Croix in Spooner, Wisconsin, I I'd like to note it, and, and I don't have the documentation, but I, I, I can get it and provide it. Uh, since that time and since the time of this application, uh, two of the opponent tribes in the state of Wisconsin have since changed their opposition to support with respect to off-reservation sites. And, and I can provide that documentation. Uh, I appreciate uh, that. We do have the information, I'd and, like, and they like do support it. We'll St. Croix is one of those we'll, tribes. We'll put that in the record. But I want to ask you, you a question, Mr. Nowega. Did you have the idea of turning this uh, dog track that was owned by Mr. Havanick into a Las Vegas casino, or did he have the idea and approach you? I did not have the idea, and, and uh, I believe that originally, yes, that, that uh, there was an opportunity that presented itself, and uh, Mr. Havnick, uh, through Bill Kadat, contacted uh, the Red Cliff Tribe. Mr. Havnick owned this uh, casino. He thought this was an opportunity to turn into a Las Vegas-style gambling. He owned the dog track, and he wanted to turn into a casino, and he thought it was a good idea to bring your tribes in on the deal, so he, uh, so he approached you about joining with him. And it would have, as you saw it, economic benefits for your tribes. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, for Red Cliff, yes. There was an opportunity to uh, gain some economic benefit. Now, now, your side on this issue had a powerful lobbyist in Washington working on the matter. You had Paul Eckstein, who was Secretary Babbitt's former law partner, uh, working for you. You had Jim Moody, the former congressman, lobbying for you. Who paid for these lobbyists? Did your tribes pay for it, or just Mr. Havanick pay for it for their services? I know that Redcliffe did not pay for, for any lobbyists. Mr. Ackley, did you pay or did Mr. Havanick pay for these lobbyists? Uh, more like to not pay, no. I have no knowledge, uh, Mr. Congressman. I left office in 1995 and just returned here in 1997, so I have no knowledge about these lobbyists. It happened after the letter was submitted uh, by Michael Anderson. Well, you would have knowledge whether you paid for those lobbyist services. Did you pay for them? No, we didn't. Okay. Not to my knowledge. And you, you're involved in litigation. Uh, who's funding the litigation you're now bringing against the Department of Interior, you or Mr. Havanick? From Redcliffe's perspective, Mr. Havnick is, is financially supporting the litigation for Redcliffe. Mr. Havnick testified that he fund, is funding these lawsuits. Do, any, do you, either of you disagree with that? The Couturier doesn't disagree with it. Pardon? I, yeah. <coughs> uh, LCO is paying for our legal counsel. Uh, Mr. Leventhal, who's here with us, or with me right now, that's the attorney, that the counsel that I'm paying for. Right. 
I, I think one point, Congressman, that, that I want to make at this time with respect to, to the direction you're heading with this issue is that, um, you know, this whole issue certainly would have been brushed under the carpet had, had not I had a friend like Mr. Havnick to support me and, and truly take a concern with respect to this issue and, and have the capital to be able to afford the litigation procedure. Otherwise, I would have been sitting at home in Wisconsin and nobody would have knew where George Nawaga was from or who he was, and I wouldn't be sitting before this committee. So, so I'm very appreciative of Mr. Havnick's uh, financial ability. I'm not criticizing him in any way. He's a businessman. He saw an opportunity to make some money. He had a dog track that was losing a lot of money. He thought maybe he could uh, rescue his investment by turning into a Las Vegas casino, but he couldn't do it because the local people wouldn't allow it. But there was a, a loophole. If he can get this declared Indian land, off reservation Indian land by the Department of Interior, then he could go ahead with this gambling operation. And he tried to take advantage of the fact that there are off reservation gambling sites. They have to be approved. They have to be approved within the Department of Interior as well as at the local uh, level. And, and we followed all of those procedures and steps, sir. I understand that you, you feel you did and you're not happy with the result, but do any of you uh, claim to be experts about all the processes within the Department of Interior in evaluating these decisions? Experts? I, I like to answer the That's question about That's not your area, our... is it? No. Your area, your, what your concern is that you wanted to have this, this gambling <laughs> casino because it would have, as you saw it, benefit you. Although, the, even though your tribes were Congressman, far the away, frustrating thing for me hard, as, a, as an Indian leader is that just, here we've got. Wait, 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 just a minute. Let me just finish my sentence, and I'm going to let you say something. It's hard to imagine that people are 200 miles away; they're necessarily going to get the jobs in those casinos. But nevertheless, you had an economic relationship with Mr. Havenick. You would have benefited from it, and uh, and uh, and therefore you went with Mr. Havenick and submitted this application. It, I, and I interrupted you, so please, did you want to? No, you go. Go ahead. Okay. Right. Now. Uh, those are the points I want to make, and, I, and what we have is a half hour on each side, and I have members on, on the Democratic side who want to ask questions. So I'm going to recognize first Mr. Lantos for... Uh, uh, for well, I'm going to recognize him for four minutes. I want to use my time with a reality check. We presumably are dealing with three Indian tribes but in fact, what we are dealing with are the machinations and shenanigans of a super-rich Florida gambling mogul who owns a complex conglomerate of gambling enterprises in a number of states, including Florida, Texas, and Wisconsin. This gambling mogul made a horrendously stupid decision. He put $40 million into a racetrack, a dog racetrack, which immediately started losing money. Every year since it opened, it lost millions and millions of dollars. The top amount was $7 million a year. <coughs> As a matter of fact, the enterprise, from an economic point of view, was so disastrous that the mogul requested that for property tax purposes, this $40 million complex be valued at $2 million. Then they found the loophole, the Indian tribes. And having read the whole document, I think it would have been criminal for the Department of the Interior to approve this project, and I tell you why. There is just one provision in this agreement which the tribes apparently were ready to sign for reasons that I find utterly incomprehensible. Under the proposal, the casino was not going to hold the parking lot near the casino itself. It was going to lease the parking lot from the mogul. Now, the tribes had the right to gambling only until 1999, with a possible extension of five years. But the parking lot contract, non-cancellable, 
ran for 25 years. So presumably the tribes agreed to pay about a million dollars a year for 25 years, even though the gambling operation could stop by 1999. If I had reviewed as a professional within the Department of the Interior this proposal, I would have turned it down so fast that you couldn't say your name fast enough. Now, this is a standard operating procedure in... Congre Georgia. Congressman? No, I'm, please don't interrupt me. <clears throat> this is a standard operating procedure in such relationships. Let me read to you from the Inspector General's report, which specifically examined lease payments made by six Wisconsin tribes for gaming machines. Now, let me tell you what the Inspector General concludes. In 1992, these six tribes paid $28.7 million for machines that they could have purchased for $2.6 million. Now let me put this in, in sort of real terms that people relate to. This is like <clears throat> being able to buy an automobile for $20,000 but leasing it for a year for a quarter million dollars. Well, you have to be out of your mind if you can buy a car for $20,000 to pay a, an, a single annual lease payment of a quarter million. That's what these six tribes did. I'll give you the figures one more time. Six tribes. My time is up. Um, I, I am convinced, having studied the record, that the decision to turn down this application on the parking lot scandal alone was the only rational decision that the Department of Interior professionals could have reached. Mr. Kanjorski for four minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to follow on what Mr. Lanza said, but I want to ask you gentlemen, are you represented by counsel or uh, professionals when you engage in these transactions? You know, give me yes or no. Yes, but I'd like to address... Because yes. No, 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 you're not going to get time uh, to ask Mr. Lando. Lando. This is my time. Now, you were represented. Are those uh, representatives of you here today that, that sir, negotiated this deal for these yes, three tribes? Yes, and it's a fine agreement. What was that? Yes, and it's a fine agreement. And I'd like to take it is a fine to agreement. Congressman Lanto's... Uh, well, you're uh, not going to answer uh, him. You're going to answer me. Do you think it's worthwhile to pay a rental fee of a million dollars a year for a piece of land. If you look at it over there, I don't think it can park 800 to 1,000 cars. That well, the purchase of that land itself at that rate, rate uh, at 10 percent return on your investment, would set the value of that parking lot alone at 10 million dollars. If you're not going to let that me you, respond, no, wait, and that you you continue to make that commitment and put your cri your tribes at risk for 25 years, even though you have no certainty. And the state at any time can discontinue within four years the license if it had been granted. You think that is a reasonable agreement to enter into a, in a, a fiduciary capacity representing your three tribes? The, the partnership was all encompassing. We were partners with respect to the parking lot agreement as well. There, there was four partners involved in this entire now wait, uh, negotiated now wait agreement. Now, wait a second. As I understand, the lease was made with this gambling interest from Florida that owned this lot. No. Uh, who, who owned it then? We did. The partnership. What partnership? Four Feathers. These Four Feathers tried. was purchasing the par parking lot? Yeah, the whole thing. I understand now, gentlemen, from what I understand, the briefing I've received is that for $39 million, Four Feathers was purchasing a part of this raceway, not including the dog portion and not including the, the parking lot. The parking lot was an additional rental that was going to reside in the original owners for $1 million to Four Feathers. Is that That's not wrong. correct? That's wrong. Well, what is the deal? And it's not criminal and it's not a scandal. The way the trust property works, you cannot mortgage a piece of trust uh, property, Mr. Congressman. What we did was we transferred, we transferred all of the mortgage over onto a piece of property, and that is the parking lot, that the bank at the day of execution was going to be transferred to the parking lot and all of that mortgage was to be placed on that parking lot. Otherwise, we'd have no access into the casino. 
Why did you buy the entire parcel? Just buy the entire parcel. We didn't have the proceeds to do that, and we had to keep what a piece of land were, out what, of what investment were you making in this? You mean the tribe was now coming up with with equity? You had money, tribal money? No, we didn't have equity. Who was putting the money in this deal? All of us as a partner once the money was generated. Now wait, there is no money. Somebody is going to front the money for fe for feathers. Did your tribes put that money up? Did you put any money into this deal? It was already built. It was already there. You're making the purchase, aren't you? Who's paying the purchase to the original owners of that property? Four Feathers, is that correct? Purchase is a dollar. Yeah, I just want to go on the record, gentlemen. I've looked over the facts, too. And I think Mr. Lanthus is absolutely correct. And all I can say is if this represents what this, uh, this opportunity for gaming to the Indian tribes of this nation is going to come down to, that a fast track operator from Florida can come up and pick straw man up to work a deal that's incredible. And the, the Congress of the United States and this committee ought to be spending its time going around finding out how many more ripoffs in this country have occurred. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Barrett, I want to yield to you the rest of our time. Thank you. I appreciate it. I come from uh, a unique perspective. I, I will not uh, take time away from the minority. You certainly will get the remainder of your time. But I think it's only fair to allow the uh, tribal leaders to respond to this series of questions. So I'm going to allow them to respond briefly. Point of order. I'm going to, I'm going to allow order. them to respond briefly, you, and then you will be able to continue your time. And will we have our inquiry. time added to? There will be no time taken away from uh, your, your questioning. Go ahead. How much time will he be given, Mr. Chairman? We'll give them, uh, what, four minutes, but we'll give you the remaining time. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes. You may respond. I don't really appreciate looking at the, at the, uh, uh, the contracts that we as tribal leaders have worked out. But I do take some, some offense that the congressmen who are sitting here today could help us by recovering the funds that have been mismanaged by the Bureau of Indian Affairs for, for the lands that we sold the United States government. So we've made some bad deals before in our time by signing treaties with the United States and seized, uh, uh, selling over 20 million acres of land to the United States government and never receiving uh, uh, full payment for those lands that we've sold. So there's a lot of bad deals going on in the Congress, not only from the tribal uh, perspective. But what I would like to say is that the, the, the contract that you referred to uh, needs approval from the National Indian Gaming Commission. We were negotiating with that organization to try to work those things out, similar to the application process with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. I don't know where we're, 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 we're done yet, but what you you can say and do whatever you want to, how you interpret that. But if you're going to make comments to us and, and without response, well, then, you know, you can have it your way. But uh, I understand what's happening here today. I just like to make those remarks a little bit of what, what my ancestors have looked like when it comes to signing the treaties with the United States. And there has been a lot of mismanagement of, of, of the Bureau of Funds, and we like to get our money back. And I don't know how the, the Congress plans on settling that, but uh, we're still waiting for some kind of answer. Thank you. Yes, yes Chairman Burton, I just wanted to make a comment to, uh, to Congressman Waxman. He, in, in, uh, early in his remarks, I never had a chance to respond that, that uh, you know, he's portraying this as, as the city and the county didn't want this, the, the, uh, this project. That might be the case right now in 1998, but you have to take a look at the frame of, at the time when this application was submitted, just like members of Congress. If you won by a 51.5% margin to get sent to Congress, you're gonna be sitting here. If you lost by a 48.5% margin, you're gonna be out there. And that vote was a, was a binding vote. We entered into a, a service agreement that's a binding contract with, this, with the city of Hudson and the county of Hud in, uh, in, and uh, St. Croix and Troy. It's let let me interrupt agreement. you by saying that vote wasn't on your proposal at all. It was on the St. Croix proposal when Mr. Havanek had St. Croix as his partner. And the people approved that in Hudson by a narrow margin, although Troy voted on it as well and voted it down. But that was not a vote on your proposal as such. Isn't that correct? Partially. There was not a vote for St. Croix. It's at an Indian tribe. But it was a different proposal than your proposal. It's at an Indian tribe. Casino. And does a vote decide the issue, or does the Department of Interior still have jurisdiction over it? If they follow the standards, the Department of Interior, Mr. Congressman. Are you, are you, does it, have you concluded your remarks? 
Okay, Mr. Waxman, you have the remainder of the time. I, I think you have four minutes remaining. Yield That's to correct. Mr. Barrett. Four Thank minutes. you. I appreciate that. I come from the state of Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, I wrote a letter in opposition uh, to expanding this dog track to include Las Vegas style gambling. Um, I opposed that expansion just as I opposed dog track um, betting when I was in the state legislature, just as I oppose, oppose casino gambling, and just as I've opposed the expansion within my own district um, of a bingo hall to include casino gambling. But that's not the issue here. Um, and I am sympathetic to all three of you. Uh, frankly, if I were your, in your shoes and someone came to me and offered me um, a deal where I could make money for the people that I represent and wouldn't have to put any money up front, it would look very attractive if I, if I was representing poor people, as all three of you do. Um, so I am not here to disparage any of you. Um, I, I think that in the position that you hold, um, that you were trying to do what was best for the people that you represent. Um, but there's more here than, than, than just that, and I think all of us recognize that. And I think when we look at this issue, um, it is important to see what the people in the state of Wisconsin want and what, what the position was and what the impact would have been on the surrounding community. And that's something that we haven't spent a lot of time on, and I do think that that's important. Uh, and, and let's start with the governor of the state of Wisconsin. The governor of the state of Wisconsin um, was quoted as saying, I don't know of any reason whatsoever, he said in referring to this, uh, to, to uh, permit this. I don't know of anybody who wants it. His spokesman, and this was in October of 1994, said that he, quote, he's completely shut the door. So the governor of the state of Wisconsin stated publicly several times. In addition, in a letter dated June 9, 1995, my position continues to be clear. <coughs> I do not support an expansion of Indian gaming in Wisconsin. No one accuses Governor Tommy Thompson of being in bed with the Democratic National Committee. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I would say that he's coming to this issue from a different perspective, and he was strongly opposed to it. But it's not even the governor, because one could make the argument that the governor is speaking for a political party, that he really doesn't speak for the people. The best way to check what the people want is to ask the people themselves. And that's exactly what happened in the state of Wisconsin on April 6, 1993, when there was a constitutional amendment on our ballot that dealt with not just the issue of gaming, but the issue of video poker, the issue of Lake Superior, Lake Michigan uh, casino boats. And in each case, the people of the state of Wisconsin spoke, and they spoke quite loudly. And, and the reason that this was on the ballot was the confusion that existed in the state of Wisconsin following the enactment in the 1980s of the lottery and the dog track, when we got the decisions from the federal government that once you started opening that door, you couldn't close that door when it came to Indian gaming. And I think that all of us from Wisconsin are, are familiar with that. Because of the concern of the proliferation of gambling, there were six questions put to the people of the state of Wisconsin. Um, and I looked at those because I think that they're instructive. I think they're instructive for the state, and I think they're instructive for this area. And two of them in particular. Question number two, do you favor a constitutional amendment that would restrict gambling casinos in the state? The entire state, yes, 61%, no, 39%. The St. Croix County, yes, 65%, no, 35%. That's a constitutional amendment. Well, that wasn't, that was an advisory, but we get to the constitutional amendment. Interestingly, because of all this talk about political influence, one of the strongest political groups in the state of Wisconsin um, is the Tavern League. And a hot issue at that time, as all of you know, um, was whether taverns should allow to have, be allowed to have video poker um, and other businesses be allowed to have video poker. So that question was on the ballot as well. Do you favor a law that would allow video poker and other forms of video gambling in the state? Entire state, yes, 34, no, 66. St. Croix County, yes, 34%, no, 66%. The reason I use those two is because I think underlying this, a concern that I have, I don't want this to be an issue about anti-Indian. That to me is an invalid reason totally for any opposition to this. I found it very interesting that there is actually greater opposition to video poker uh, in the state of Wisconsin, something that the Tavern League wants, than to, to Indian gaming. Again, both overwhelmingly rejected in this area. But what that goes to is the, the vast opposition in this area. Politician after politician 
came out against this. Now, there may be reasons that, that, that different reasons for people to doing it. I, as I stated, am against gambling. But the point is, in this discussion, I think we're making a huge mistake if we ignore that. For one reason, I'll, I'll conclude very briefly. If the federal government had approved this, you would have had Republican after Republican and Democrat after Democrat howling to the moon about how unresponsive the federal government was on this issue because they were all against it. But here's an instance when the federal government went along with the community desires. And I yield back the balance. How much time, time has expired? Uh, for the members, we will go till 1 o'clock and then we'll break for about 45 minutes so, so everyone can uh, have some lunch. Uh, did you want to briefly respond? Yes, if I could, Mr. Chairman. Okay, well, briefly. First of all, I'd just like to say that I find a real contradiction in your uh, remarks, Congressman Barrett. First of all, the United States Congress passes IGRA and outlines how Indian tribes can place land into trust and how we enter into a compact with our state, in this particular case, the state of Wisconsin, which we did. Tommy Thompson signed an agreement. It provides for an additional site. The referendum that you're referring to is absolutely correct. However, uh, under the current compact, the amendment doesn't cut off a second site and the proposal that we're putting forth. <laughs> and also, let me just say this. I might be naive in your politics out here, but let me assure you, I wouldn't have moved forward with this in my meetings with the governor if he said, there's no chance in hell I'm going to sign this. I'm, I'm reading from the June 9th, 1995 letter. Quote, my position continues to be clear. Okay. I do not support an expansion of Indian gaming in Wisconsin. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Micah. Did you, Thank you, you, Mr. Would, uh, do you Chairman. Do you want to go next, or would you yes, like, uh, just, yes, Mr. No, Mike. Right. Thank you. Uh, Chairman uh, Nuago, uh, you, I think, stated at some point that uh, basically Congress had really set the stage for allowing uh, Indians to uh, uh, gamble. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I guess that was the uh, law passed in uh, 1988, uh, which I've got a copy of that. Uh, I guess it was uh, Indian gaming legislation introduced by Mr. Udall and uh, I think some June 9th, 1995 letter, quote, my position continues to be clear. Okay. I do not support an expansion of Indian gaming in Wisconsin. Gentlemen's time has expired. Thank uh, you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Micah. Did you, Thank you, you, Mr. Chairman. Do you want to go next or would you rather? Yes, uh, yes, yes, Mr. Mike. Right. Thank you. Uh, Chairman uh, Nuago, uh, you I think stated at some point that uh, basically Congress had really set the stage for allowing uh, Indians to uh, uh, gamble. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And I guess that was the uh, law passed in uh, 1988, uh, which I've got a copy of that. Uh, I guess it was uh, Indian gaming legislation introduced by Mr. Udall, and um, I think some members of this panel, like Mr. Waxman and Mr. Lantos and Mr. Kanjorski, I think even Mr. Burton voted for that legislation. So those are the individuals that set basically the law and parameters by which uh, uh, Indians could uh, uh, undertake uh, certain types of gambling and betting uh, on their reservations. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to have this uh, made a part of the record, if I can. Uh, this is the those members of Congress who supported uh, that legislation. Without objection. So basically, they, the Congress set up the, the, uh, the law, and then rules were made. And I believe all of the chairmen of the tribes that are sitting here felt that they were abiding by the rules and regulations that were set up. Is that correct? Yes. 
Yes, that's correct. Uh -huh. And you weren't experts in how to proceed, but you hired expertise uh, uh, and engaged expertise. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. And I guess the reason that you did this is uh, the per capita income of your tribe mem tribal members is about uh, six or seven thousand dollars a year. Is that correct? For Redcliffe, yes. And one of the competitors, I guess, uh, who who didn't want you to to have this uh, this uh, new gambling enterprise was the uh, is it Shakopee's? Yes. And That's their uh, Per member income was around three hundred and ninety thousand dollars per member. Is that uh, somewhere in the range? Well, that's income? what I've heard. Anywhere up to four hundred fifty thousand. And would that be some reason that they might oppose uh, uh, your gaining this ability to conduct uh, this additional gambling on a, a gambling site? Is that correct? Yes. Uh, well, you tried to play the game pretty fair. What was your reaction when you found out that two people in the Secretary of Interior's office who were uh, driving a decision uh, left the department and got lucrative contracts uh, with the uh, tribes that fought you on this application? How'd you feel uh, then? Chairman, we could just go right down if you'd respond. Well, I felt really, uh, you know, I felt slighted by this, that, uh, that as elected tribal leader, that, uh, that I was not consulted beforehand, and uh, that uh, the, the, uh, the special interest group and influence uh, played a role in this process. Mr. Act. I felt somewhat hurt, but uh, I've also known that Mr. Duffy was in charge of, uh, of the trust fund, too, that he, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs misappropriated, so it doesn't surprise me too much. Chairman Noego. I think, as, as my colleagues have mentioned, that and I, I felt slighted and, and, and I felt um, um, surprised and, and I felt victimized by, by this whole process. And each of you testified uh, that you had no indication that you uh, ha or had any reason from anyone in the department to indicate that your uh, application was going to be rejected. Is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you know this, but under the uh, Ethics in Government Act, uh, what, what was done by Mr. Uh, Collier, Tom Collier and John Duffy, uh, it is prohibited except for one loophole, which uh, there is an exception in the law that allows federal employees to leave their government job and immediately represent Native American tribes before their former agencies. Are you aware of that loophole? I wasn't made aware of that till today. No, I'm not aware of that. Uh, <laughs> don't you feel that that should be a change? You think that that's right for folks to step right out of uh, government uh, uh, and then into a, a position of conflict? Yes, I agree with that. Yes, I agree with that too. Mm -hmm. So uh, this isn't all being driven by some Florida Mongol uh, who uh, uh, is trying to make a, a huge uh, amount of profit. I felt uh, that it was all depends what state you came from. If you come from Connecticut, it's okay. But if you come from Wisconsin, Minnesota can get involved in your politics. That's why I feel. Thank you. The gentleman's time has ex expired. Is the Mongol in the room? <laughs> I think you meant mogul. <clears throat> uh, who's next on your side? Mr. Barrett. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I could follow up on that point because I think one of the issues here that we talked about, Mr. Ackley, you just referred to Connecticut. Connecticut was a situation where the land was contiguous to the trust land. Is that, is that correct? I don't, I don't believe so. I, I believe so. I believe so. We can check on that. And I, but you would agree, wouldn't you, that there's, there's a difference between these applications when the land is contiguous to the land that's in trust and when it is, say, 200 miles from, from the reservation land. Yeah, but there was a lot of local uh, uh, um, people objecting to the casino to being developed there. But the test, the legal test that, that the department undertakes, my understanding is, is a difference. But again, I think that 
that there is a, uh, there's a difference here between, between the two. And, and I want to get back because I think Mr. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce your name. Gashkabash, uh, Gashkabash. You stated that in the preparation for this, that you hired some accountants, is that correct? Or someone to do a feasibility study, is that correct? Arthur Anderson. Arthur uh, Anderson. An economist, uh, Dr. Murphy. That, was R. that Murray. someone that the, that the tribe hired, or was that someone that, that someone else hired? Who hired that person? Uh, the partnership hired. Okay, so that was, none of the tribes put up any money for that, is that correct? Well, if you read the partnership, the way this was going to, there's operational costs that were going to be deducted uh, from the actual, you know, once the I understand casinos that. operate. I understand that. Right. That's fine. But, but you, your tribe never wrote any check to Arthur Anderson. I don't believe so. Okay. Mr. Ackley? No. Mr. 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 Barrett, my tribe and I personally have looked at the Kakana dog track on the eastern part of the state to look at acquiring that site for a casino conversion dog track also. So Hudson's not just uh, something that came to me in the whim in the middle of the night. Believe me, that was crucial in my desire to write a letter because we have five dog tracks in the state of Wisconsin, most of, a, of not all having financial problems. And I think that the scenario that could be seen in the state of Wisconsin is that five dog tracks that had promised the moon and were failing would now all want to become Las Vegas style casinos. And so even though my district is not contiguous or even within 100 miles, 200 miles of, of this location, the scenario that I think some of us had was, okay, here's the first one, then we go to the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. And again, as Mr. Waxman pointed out, you have a situation here where there is a loophole that exists and, and it's there to, to protect and encourage economic development for the Indians. But I think that there comes a point when the wishes of the people in the state of Wisconsin also come into play. And that's something that I want to make reference to, to Representative Gunderson's letter, um, because he was the congressman from this area. Um, and he states in his letter, dated April 24th, 1995, the proposed casino dog track in Hudson is nothing more than a, an attempt to save a failing pre-existing Greyhound track. The non-Indian track owners see Indian gaming as a potential source of revenue for themselves. He also goes on to talk about this being essentially a precedent-setting case, and I think all of us would agree with that. Um, this is an, an unusual case. Wouldn't you agree with that, that this is an unusual case? First ever, yeah. First ever. No precedent whatsoever, nothing to draw on, because this is the first time we've attempted to push the envelope this far. So, I, again, I understand your frustration, um, but when we start talking about other decisions that were made involving Indian gaming, they really are comparing apples to oranges because this is such a different type of application. And again, I think that that's something that, that has to be said for the record. This, is not, this was not a run-of-the-mill application. And I fully agree with what you have said that yes, opposing tribes, well, there were tribes that were opposed to this. Um, and the department met with them. But if you look at the statute, um, under the statute, the secretary and I'm quoting now from 2719, Section B, 1A, the secretary, after consultation with the Indian tribe and appropriate state and local officials, including officials of other nearby tribes, determines that a gaming, and it goes on. So the, the secretary had an obligation, I think, under the statute to meet with the other tribes. Now, again, I'm not going to get involved in, in the federal lawsuit as to whether there were mistakes made by the Department of Interior, but I think that the department frankly, would not have been doing its job if it did not consult as the statute requires them to, um, to meet with other tribes. Would the gentleman yield to I me? I would yield. Why were you surprised that, that, since this is the first ever kind of application for this kind of casino, why were you surprised that, the, that your application was subjected to scrutiny and, if, and you were shocked that it was turned down? It just seems to me that this thing reeks with controversy. You might have been convinced of your merits. And, the, and that it was good, I, you know, that you should have gotten it approved, but nevertheless, you should have had some suspicions with all the, when the governor, Republican governor lines up, your Republican congressman's against it, the community's up in arms. Why are you surprised that you, you possibly ran into a roadblock? Um, if, I, if I may respond to that. <clears throat> um, with respect gentlemen, to the issue. Time has expired. Gentlemen, you may respond. Thank you. Um, with respect to the issue, I, I think it needs to be made clear that, that Although this particular application may have its own uh, individuality, the, um, this has been done in the past off reservation sites. 
We have one in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Pottawatomie site is off reservation. We have the Turtle Lake site that we mentioned earlier. And um, we have a casino in, in Duluth, Minnesota, ran by the Fond du Lac tribe. So th there, there has been the precedence established, um, just that this, this did have some individuality. And there's also the uh, Mr. Sauter. tribe in Detroit. I'd like to say for the record, right off the bat, I'm tired of people covering up for political payoffs. Uh, and would you I would pull your like mic, to see, you pull your mic a little closer. Uh, I would like to see some cooperation like there was in Watergate and other types of hearings from the minority to try to learn the truth rather than trying to constantly cover up for, us, in this case, a Secretary of the Interior who's admitted he's lied, but we have a Chief of Staff and a Consul who then taken a job afterwards with the very tribes that are most affected and then uh, laundered money or directly gave money, didn't even bother to launder it. Some may have come in through other uh, directions, but money into the campaign, and it's shocking. And what really amazes me is, is that the party that claims constantly and beats us up for caring about the poor takes the poor Indian tribes and through the connections to try to exclude you out of that process. And then today tries to distort information. I want to say up front, I believe gambling is a moral sin and I believe you're wrong to pursue the casinos. And I would have not voted for the bill that Mr. Waxman, Mr. Lantos, and Mr. Kanjorski voted for. And I don't like this manipulation of going off the, the reservations. And uh, for example, when I was in Duluth last year, and let me ask some questions here, uh, that there's a casino in downtown a long way from the reservations. Is that not true? Yes. I lived in, in the western suburbs of Minneapolis and have visited Shakopee. And the Mall of America is down there, and there's plenty of other things. I don't recall that land really being mostly given to Indian tribes in that area. That is a high traffic, high density area that's very lucrative, and that's why that tribe's getting $400,000. Is that not correct? That's what I think, too. Do you believe that in this case, and do people in your tribes believe that basically the law at BIA and the law in this government is one law for poor people and one law for people who have clout and money and are willing to do payoffs? Is that part of the impression that's certainly circulating? Because when you go through the events with this, that's what it looks like to an outsider. That's absolutely correct. In 1994, there was a, there was a dinner with, the, uh, with, the, uh, with some Indian tribes and the vice president uh, some of the wealthier tribes that could afford a hundred dollar or a thousand dollar a plate dinner with the vice president, and the smaller tribe uh, could not afford that type of, of of a dinner and access. And so the question arises to me: Is there tribes with large so sovereignty, and there's tribes with small sovereignty? And those small sovereignty mean is meaningless. So you're absolutely correct. Because the problem is with this law. And as I understand the law, because in Indiana we've had a fight about the Potawatomi's putting in. Uh, a casino in northern Indiana, and that uh, the governor of a state has an automatic power to block this. And in fact, uh, you said that you wouldn't have gone ahead if you'd have gotten that from Governor Thompson, because isn't it true that you as tribes, which I don't agree with, but you have rights to put a certain number of casinos in, and Governor Thompson's position was he wanted a net reduction of gambling, and you were willing to make some agreements that would have potentially resulted in less casinos had you got this one. Is that not correct? And could you explain that? Because there seems to be contradictory statements on the record. I have a headline here, and I'd like to insert this article on the record. Thompson says he won't stop casino at dog track. There are different things here, because at any point, he could have said forthrightly, as the governor of Indiana does, it won't happen here in the Ben Over, and you wouldn't have spent your money or your time. That's right. That, that's absolutely correct. In fact, the governor, again, I have my compact with me. If the committee would like a copy of it, I could make that available to you and, uh, and, and look at Le Couture, uh, compact signed by Governor Thompson. The governor, in fact, encouraged one or more tribes to get into an off-reservation site rather than having 11 tribes in Wisconsin have 11 off-reservation sites. He encouraged tribes to consolidate. In this case, these three, four tribes right here consolidated. Was your, uh, the opposition to you doing this casino uh, in Hudson predominantly coming from the St. Croix tribe or was it predominantly coming from the wealthier tribes in Minnesota? Minnesota. By predominantly, uh, would you say that most of the contributions going into the administration, most of the lobbying certainly were coming from law, law firms and people who were from Minneapolis uh, that the whole Wisconsin thing is really here kind of a diversion, <clears throat> and it's a, uh, an issue many of us feel strongly about gambling, but really this is a political 
question of political payoff and influence because, in fact, the local community had certainly, the, one other thing for the record, the dog track vote was not, it was a Hudson dog track casino vote, even if the tribe initially proposing it was different. Is that not correct? And that's what you're trying to explain for the record. Right. And that, in fact, early on, indications were from the local community. It was only later on, after the political contribution started and after the political manipulation started, that the local opinion, in fact, triumphed in a, a local election. So it is not, and that's why, in fact, in the early documents, in the draft documents, all the indications were that the administration was going to improve it. And you were going along that direction, and the governor was going to improve it. Otherwise, why would you, as a poor tribe, have wasted your time at this particular location? It doesn't even make sense. Correct. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Lantos next. Mr. Lantos. Thank you, Mr. Excuse Chairman. Me. Uh, I, Excuse me. Uh, Mr. Fatah, I was going to recognize the, I don't know, your 30 minutes you allocated to different members. We're under the five-minute rule. Under the five-minute rule, I think Mr. Lantos is, uh, is, is next. But I think you're a wonderful guy anyhow. <laughs> Mr. Lantos. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, uh, since my friend from Indiana made some observations which I do not think are accurate, uh, and since we haven't paid the courtesy to the visitors from Wisconsin to be heard, I want to be their voice. We will hear one of them later today, but I want to, I want to give you an inkling of what they are saying. Colleen Maloney, would you raise your hand? She is a mother, a healthcare professional, member of the Hudson Housing Authority, and an active participant in the petition drive against the casino in Hudson. She wants to live with her family in a wholesome community free of gambling. Tom Irwin. Tom, will you? One of Hudson representatives on the St. Croix County Board of Supervisors. He's president of the Hudson Library Board. He opposes casino gambling because it doesn't promote a healthy family and community environment. Mary Hawksford. Mary? She's a stay-at-home mother of four young children. Her husband commutes daily right in front of the dog track, as she does on her way to schools, grocers, and the other activities of the day. Hudson is presently a very tranquil, beautiful, family-oriented community, she says. She feels a casino will bring crime, congestion, and temporary visitors that don't care about the community where she lives. Lori Pepper. Lori has been a resident for 22 years. She's one of a large extended family living in the city of Hudson who love their community and do not wish to see it affected adversely by the introduction of Nevada-style casino gambling. She's the mother of three young children. She's a church musician. She's also taking a moral stand against gambling and the proposed expansion of casino gambling in her state. Tim and Wendy Hood. <clears throat> They're both professionals working in an international corporation in the Twin Cities. They moved to Hudson because they like the quiet, small-town, rural atmosphere close to the Twin Cities. They would never have chosen to live in town with casino gambling. Don Jordan, he is not here. He's a professional at a Fortune 500 company. He's opposing casino gambling. Um, Michael Madden, Michael. She, he's in the investment business in Minneapolis. He has a 32-mile one-way commute every day from his home in rural Hudson. The road in front of his home goes right past the dog track. They moved to this location eight years ago, looking for rural contentment. The traffic generated by a casino development would seriously impact the traffic traveling past his home. He's also a board member of a YMCA camp, which is located right across the road from the dock track, which would clearly be incompatible with Nevada-style casino gambling. Mark Reland. Mark is director of human resources for Philips Plastic Corporation. Philips employs 1,500 people with two facilities in Hudson. He's committed not to expand into communities that have casinos or gambling. I would like to, since there has been some question about the governor's statement, I'd like to show a tape of the Republican governor's statement on this issue. Good. I can assure you, we're not going to expand 
uh, Indian gaming any place in the state without further remuneration. And you know something? I will continue to work to limit gambling in this state. I was the one that was instrumental in calling the legislature back in, and I think the senator will even acknowledge that, to ask for a constitutional amendment. I was joined with the, the attorney general. We went around the state, and the people voted for it, and I think that is what is the law of the land, and that should stand. 30 seconds, Senator Butler, Mr. Fowler. That's it. Uh, now, now, to have our colleagues on the other side with overwhelming community opposition, the Republican governor's opposition, the Republican congressman's opposition, to, to claim that there is something wrong in the Department of Interior turning down a preposterously exploitative contract. That contract concerning the parking lot should be taught in business school as how not to agree to a pattern of exploitation running for a quarter century. You are victims. The Indian tribes are victims in this case, not of the Department of the Interior, but of a greedy, wealthy Florida gambling operation which took advantage of a loophole or tried to take advantage of a loophole in the law but fortunately failed. Parliamentary point, Mr. Chairman. Time has expired. The gentleman will state his parliamentary inquiry. Uh, it's a parliamentary point. The governor of Wisconsin did not come out against the casino. That he, What he said was he wanted a net reduction in gambling, which in fact, depending on the agreement, it would have occurred, and that should be clarified for the record. I, I, I think point, that... Uh, point I, think of I have a letter here again. If you'd like me to read it, I'll read it well, for the third uh, time. The gentleman will suspend. We, we've seen newspaper articles saying one thing and the governor m mentioning what that was just uh, mentioned by my colleague from Indiana. I, I think that speaks for itself. We'll let the media uh, go through all of that. Point of parliamentary procedure. Gentleman will state his If point. the gentleman from Indiana and the other members of the committee vote for my uh, request that the governor be invited to this hearing, we could get his views directly on the record. That's not a, re that's not a proper parliamentary inquiry. We will stand here.